just be a couple more seconds. All right, good girl. Good, good girl. Yeah. Good, good <laughs> Thank good you. Way to talk, huh? Is that <laughs> Did you say that was misogynistic? Didn't you tell me that oh, I was that, a misogynist one oh, time? Well, you you know, know what it was. Well, here's the thing. One of the things, you have the best memory of any person I've ever met. And so mm. now I know that. And I'll be very careful what I say. Hey, everyone. Well, welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ. And this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for Monday with the McDougals. And Dr. McDougal today is going to be discussing the real truth about weight loss drugs. He touched on it last night in his live, which he does every Sunday night. He won't be doing it Super Bowl Sunday because People will probably be watching the Super Bowl, but 5 p.m. Pacific time every Sunday night. You can watch Dr. McDougal do a live. He answers your questions and he also comes here once a month. Hi, Dr. McDougal. Thanks for being here. And how are you? Oh, I'm just fine. Can, can, do, can we, we touch the topic of misogyny or should we not leave it alone? Well, yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's your show, whatever you want. I oh, think you know, I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to in any way put you on the spot. No, that's okay. Because I do improv comedy, so I am used to being you, put on. You, the you spot. are really good. Yeah. So, and, and so I, I, yeah. I I was hurt because you didn't come to my presentation when I spoke at your conference, and I didn't realize that you're also a busy working doctor, and you didn't not come because you didn't like me or want to see it, but you were seeing patients, and so. <laughs> I, I, I certainly watched it afterwards, but is that why I deserve the 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 title of a misogynist? I, I didn't even know what a misogynist was back then. I can't believe I said it. I mean, what? I mean, I got a. That's why I work with Dr. Lyle. Sometimes my mouth goes faster than my brain. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. I just want to know how is how's my report been over the last fifteen years? How oh, much you're, misogyny you're, have I been participating in? I just. You know, this is a this is an open show. We might as well get honest about it. You have not. I mean, not your daughter loves you. Your granddaughter yeah. loves you. Your wife loves you. So, yeah. and, well, um, you know, just to put it out on the record, I love women. <laughs> <A lot of them. laughs> my daughter, my my mother, my wife, my and you too, AJ. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I develop a, a and, and a, I, I a do really sincerely attraction to you. I sincerely apologize for saying yeah. that. I cannot believe I did that. So. And you forgave me, so thank you so no, much. No, anytime I have a chance to learn something, I appreciate it. And that's why, of course, <laughs> I sincerely open myself to criticism. I mean, not nasty stuff. I'm not too good at that. And I don't call names very well. But well what's what's anyway. interesting about you is you, you seem to have a pretty thick skin for criticism. You've always said, I'd rather be hated than ignored. So you're, yeah. you, you, know, you, can, you seem to take it, even if it's undeserved. Well, uh, you know, I might just... Uh, just have to go hide in a corner for a while until I get adjusted to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, yeah, is, uh, oh yeah, but I think it's age, quite honestly. You know, when I was younger, I used to get very offended and defensive about things, but, you know, I've been at this for 55 years and I just figure they don't know what they're talking about because I've been over this over and over again. And if I can't think of the proper answer immediately, I certainly will be over in a short period of time because, you know, I believe, and I want you to know, and I'm going to say it right clearly. I believe that the McDougal program is as close to the ideal human diet as possible. I didn't say we're perfect, but I think we're as close. Uh, I don't know anybody that comes uh, near as close. To, uh, certainly a raw diet doesn't. Uh, a vegan diet doesn't. A uh, whole food plant-based diet, uh, place, whole food plant, you know, whatever. Yeah. Based diet. It, 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 could, it could, but it, it doesn't always. I mean, if you live on broccoli and kale and cabbage, you, you know, that's not a starch-based diet. Anyway, I just wanted to start out our our listeners with, our viewers with a a little little controversy, a little discussion. Well, anyway, I, I, I want to... How do you... You have this uncanny ability. I don't know if you have, what is it called, an endemic memory. Like, you will say, yeah. somebody will ask you a question, you go, oh, yeah, it's in my May 2017 newsletter. How do you remember facts like that? Well, you know, AJ, I think you remember things that you like. You know, like, for example, I'm not very good at names, but if you come up to me and you say hello, I can tell you what your cholesterol was. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just really strange. You're, you're, you're the person with the cholesterol 237 and the BUN of, you know, 28. And uh, yeah, I remember you, but what's your name? What's your name? I, you know, it, it, it depends on what you really are interested in. And of course, I, I spent somewhere between a week and two weeks writing each and every newsletter every month. And I'm talking about somewhere between four and 16 hour days. Well, of course I remembered. 
These are my children. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Anyway, that's and the same thing with research papers. You know, there's some that really stick with me. Of course, those are the ones that favor my point of view. But they're usually the right ones, too. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, AJ, but whatever, whatever, whatever label you may use, I probably deserve it when you <laughs> when you call me a particular name. I, I'm sure I deserve it, but not Thank misogynist. You. Like, I didn't even know what it meant. Thank you. I do now. I've met a lot of them. <laughs> I've met a lot of them. And, you know, when I look in the mirror, I, I really honestly don't see one. I, as I say, I, anyway, let's go on with the show. Thanks, Dr. McDougall. All right. Uh, let's see. What should we do today? Uh, uh, well, why don't we start with some, with some slide presentations? Uh, I have been working really hard on trying to make ourselves popular. And I've been doing it for 48 years now. You know, I've done whatever I can. I, we've taught uh, evening classes. Uh, we've taught in our basic general practice office in an education room. You know, I, I've lectured in, in big halls, uh, you know, sometimes as many as a thousand people. I had a uh, worldwide television show, two of them, uh, Lifestyle Magazine, which went to 95% of the households for, oh, I don't know, 28 years it's been playing, still playing. I still look uh, occasionally on it. I was co-host of that. And then I had my own show, McDougall MD, for five or six years. 95% of the households. We run a newsletter and we ran uh, adventure trips, you know, to try and get people to understand this message, to communicate it. You know, it took people all over, all over North and South America and Hawaii and so on. And many of you have been on these trips. I wish you would have been. They were really fun. Uh, and then we run these programs. We run the, uh, the hospital-based program at St. Lena Hospital for 16 years. And then a uh, resort program for 18 years. And now we do the most successful anything we've ever done, which is uh, the telemedicine program, which we encourage people to enroll in. We've been doing it for three years now. We can honestly say the results are far better than any of our resort programs. So uh, people learn better. Uh, they are more successful. The weights, the cholesterols, blood pressures, reductions in medications are even better than we used to get in the live-in program. Plus, you didn't have to spend $10,000 to come and see us. So, you know, I've been trying to figure out some way to get the public's attention, some way to, to find some, some crack in the wall where I, the light will shine in. You know how the saying goes. And so far, I haven't done it. I really haven't done it. You know, when I see people go viral with silly things and, you know, they have 50 million views overnight, I mean, Good grief. You can check the number of views that uh, AJ and I get on this show. It's not close to that. Anyway, the point being is we have a uh, mon monumental worldwide profit-oriented movement right now that I'm going to try and take advantage of. And that, that worldwide, well, it's not worldwide. It hasn't hit Asian countries yet or African countries, but Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada, and wherever else rich people live. And that is the attack on the obesity problem with a drug. These are semaglutides, Ozempic, Wegovi, Manjaro, uh, Zepbound. Hey, I've got four of them. I can remember four of them. There are going to be about 10 more out here pretty soon. And uh, I, I want to talk to you about that because they are so popular. In fact, the, these people have declared that they're going to take over the world. They're going to be the most profitable business in the world, the most profitable drug companies in the world. They've come out and said it. And you know what? They have every reason to believe that they're right. Because 91% of people, and I gave you the data recently, 91% of people are over fat for good health. That's 69% of children. So the market is absolutely huge. And they just can't figure out how to lose weight healthily. And so... Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to mooch in on their on their success by presenting a challenge. And the challenge is, is the McDougal diet is far better. A starch-based diet, let's just call it a starch-based diet so we don't get too personal. And I won't call it Ozempic or, or Wegovy, I'll call it semaglutides. So, you know, starch-based diet against semaglutides. How, how do we fare? Uh, when intelligent people buy into this argument 
Well, you know, not always because intelligent people are ruled by stories that keep them fat and sick. You know, stories like you need protein, you need meat to get your protein, and dairy to get your calcium, and fish to get your omega threes. And, you know, it's okay to be fat. That's one of the stories that's going around. I and mean, after all, everybody, 91% of people. Yeah. So they have every right to believe that they're going to be the most dominant, important company in the world. They're going to put the food businesses in trouble. The ph pharmaceutical businesses are going to lose money. Doctors are going to lose money. Why? Because they cause people to lose weight. So they're not as sick. They cause people to eat less food. So don't buy as much food. They don't go out to restaurants as much. They they have to, well, maybe they'll buy new clothes. Maybe the clothing industry will at least hit a temporary uh, improvement in their sales. But, um, you know, there are lots of reasons. It's just, just not, it's not just lack of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. I understand that. You realize that the first book that Mary and I wrote in 1979, 1979, we didn't title it The McDougal Diet or Heal and Stay Healthy. The title of the book is, and still is, Making the Change. That's the hard part, is changing. Get people to change. And I, I just listed a whole bunch of ways that Mary and I have tried over the past uh, 47 years to get people's attention and to make it easy for them to change and a possibility. And it's really important because they're being cheated, they're being lied to, they're having their health and their money stolen from them by this particular fraction of the drug companies. And let me show you why. All right, let's, uh, oh, oh, you know what? I, excuse me, I gotta go back and do this over again because I didn't do it right, so thank you. Now, if I can ever get it right again. <laughs> Technology is not necessarily one of my, uh, here we go. All right, I think we're, we're in pretty good shape now. All right, this is uh, some of the data I've shown you before uh, about the semi-glutides. And I, it's a good review, a good summary to bring you up to date on what the research shows. And by the, by the way, you listen to me carefully. All of the research, all of the research paid for is, is paid for on these drugs by Eli Lilly and Novadisc, two of the biggest drug companies in the world. All the research is funded and controlled by them. But let's look at what their research shows for just a minute. Uh, this is a, a summary example of what happens on semi-glutides. And here you see a, a, a graph that I want to go through with you on the left. They start at, uh, at uh, the, the baseline body weight. And what they look at is they look at percentage percentages of weight loss. They don't look at pounds. It makes it a little confusing for you to understand. But those figures on the left-hand side of the chart are percentages of weight loss, like you know, maximum 20% weight loss. That means if you start at uh, 200 pounds, 20% of that would be 40 pounds. Okay, a little simple math. But that's what you see on the left-hand side. On the x-axis, you see the, uh, the timeline. And you see in terms of weeks, the timeline. Okay, so let's see what happens. You start at point zero, the study starts. What they do is they divide a group of people into two groups, one a control group, which they don't give the drugs to, and one a intervention group, which gets the medication, okay? And what they do in addition is they prescribe for both groups that they must cut back on the calorie intake by about 500 calories a day, and they must exercise. Well, based on the reduction of calories of 500 calories a day, and some exercise. Look, look at what the uh, control group has done. They have the light gray line. You know, they've lost, uh, let's see, 2%. Let's say they started at 200 pounds. That's uh, four pounds. All right. Well, you got to subtract the four pounds or the 2% from any other figures that you look at because that's a control group. And the intervention only got that much better. All right. So we'll, we'll take a look at the more solid line here as the weeks progress. What you see is people continue to lose weight. Why do they lose weight? They will lose weight because they become ill. And why do they become ill? Because they get a der derivative of a reptile poison, the Gila monster from the Southwest United States. 
And what they did is they took this poison from the lower jaw of this uh, reptile, which has a poison as toxic as a, as a rattleback diamond, uh, a diamondback rattlesnake. All right. So they take this drug, which lasts about this venom, which lasts about two minutes. And for those two minutes, you get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness. I mean, you're really sick after you get bit, but then it goes away. And the Gila Botster doesn't hold on long enough or inject enough venom to kill you. You, you almost never, or probably never die from a Gila monster bite. So anyways, they took this venom back to the lab and what they did is they figured out ways to make the poisoning last longer. So they figured out how to make it last a, a half a day and then a day, and now it lasts a week. Yeah, just through modern chemistry, it lasts longer. So you, you, you get poisoned all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week by a derivative of Gila monster poison. All right, so that's how you lose the weight. And you do lose weight. Look at the heavy dark black line up there. You see the progressive weight loss up until 68 weeks. All right, they lose 20% of their weight, 20% of, of the weight that they started at. They started at like three, 233 pounds. 20% uh, of that would be about 37 pounds. So what they do is they lose 37 pounds up until 68 weeks. And then the body says, hey, 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 man, woman, boy, girl, child, female, male, it's time to stop. You're going to die. And the appetite becomes becomes equal to the poisoning effects. So you get the reduction of the appetite plus the desire to stay alive. And finally, the body says, I've, take, I've had enough. And it stops losing weight. It stops the reduction of calories. Otherwise, you die of malnutrition. Wouldn't look good for sales if they included it in their ads, would it? Oh, this is a great drug. Except uh, if you follow beyond 68 weeks, uh, you'll die of starvation. I mean, you don't. The body, the body compensates. All right, so at 68 weeks, you hit a plateau. I mean, you hit a plateau. You don't lose any more weight on average. And that plateau has been measured out to 104 weeks. So uh, this, let's just summarize it. The weight loss uh, takes 68 weeks for the full, full amount. The average is 37 pounds. And the cost is $17,000 for this year and a quarter of poisoning. All right. So that's kind of a summary of the drugs. Remember, these start, these, these, this study started out with a baseline of 233 pounds. That's, that's where the subject started at an average. So when you when we look at the next chart, you got to realize the comparison starts at much less weight. And so you're going to expect people to lose more weight if they start at a higher baseline weight, just the way it is. So I put together a chart for you. And Chef AJ and Charles, they're going to make they're going to try and put this chart up. Yeah. We're working chat. on it now. It will be done before the end of the show, I promise you. Okay, thank you, AJ. This is, I, I'm after a lot of work into this. No, I don't mean just, you know, putting the chart together, uh, which took me about a day. But I, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, probably 10, year, 10 years of researching these new drugs and, and uh, 47 years of clinical practice doing diet therapy. So a lot of work went into this chart, and I hope you appreciate it. Uh, average weight loss at one year. Okay, one year average weight loss on our program, the McDougal program, is 22 pounds. Okay, but our our participants started out at a weight of 190. On on the semaglutides, you know, I told you they lose 37 pounds, but that's a 68 weeks. At a year, they lose 25 pounds. So comparatively similar weight losses. You know. Uh, one of the studies that uh, you're you're familiar with or should be is the study from New Zealand, which showed the average weight loss was 25.3 pounds. So in that particular study, we certainly showed that we are comparative in weight loss over a year with making yourself sick. All right. You don't reach a plateau when you uh, follow our program. You hit trim body weight, and then the body naturally stops because you're in ideal health. You're in an ideal way to survive, to function best, look best, feel best. So the body naturally stops at, at its normal intended weight. Whereas uh, a plateau is reached on these the uh, semaglutides at 68 weeks. You've lost 37 pounds because the body knows this is wrong. 
you know, to suffer from chronic poisoning. It tries to make adjustments to keep you alive. So you got to plateau with these, these particular drugs. Uh, let's compare what happens to your appetite. Your appetite is enhanced, satisfied. You get pleasure out of eating. I mean, Doug Lyle could, you know, spend an hour telling you about the pleasure trap he has <laughs> and, and how eating brings this or can bring this to your life. And that's what we do. Whereas uh, appetite suppressed, that's how it works. They call it food noise. That kind of sexy food noise, right? Anyway, that's what they call it. And uh, so uh, the expected the expected effects. Now, these aren't the side effects or undesirable effects. This is the desired effects that you expect to get. The expected effects on our program, maybe a little extra ball gas, a little flatus. They expect for their program to work Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sickness. In fact, there's this direct correlation between being sick and how sick you are with your results on the program. So that's their goal, to make you sick. Um, our desired effects, our desired effects is a feeling of well-being, relief of your problems. And you will. You know, if you suffer from food poisoning, and probably plus 90% of you do, or did you're not in this group? No, for no, no, no way in this group. Uh, then you should expect your your problems to go away: the constipation, the indigestion, the tiredness, the oily skin. Those are the short term effects. Uh, the goal of these semi glutides is to make you feel unwell. Do I need to say that again? Oh, you got. I think you got it. Uh, pregnancy. It's contraindicated. Read my January 2011 newsletter on pregnancy. It'll show you that the, the diet I teach, a starch-based diet without any animal foods, that means no dairy, no meat, no chicken, no fish, is the, is the ideal way to carry out a pregnancy with the least possibility of having uh, congenital defects, the least possibility of having a cesarean section, the least possibility of you gaining excess weight. The best possibility of having an offspring is the McDougall program. Why? Because of what I told you in the beginning. We believe we're as close, pretty darn close to what the human being is supposed to eat. I'll leave open a, a few modifications so you can you can help me improve the program. But that's why it's ideal for pregnancies, because that's the way we were built. You know, starting say a million, million years ago, two and a half million years ago. I don't know. We won't get into that argument. Cost. Reduce your food bill. Food bill. If you eat out a lot, it reduces it by 80%. If you have been a fairly health food oriented person, maybe 20% reduces it. Spend that money uh, on other things, clothes, electric cars, all kinds of things. But you're going to have to set aside a big chunk of your money for retirement to buy these drugs because it's going to cost you $1,000 to $1,400 a month. And that means over a 17, or over that period of time, you'll spend $17,000. That's a big deal for most of us. All right, uh, <clears throat> regain lost weight when you stop. Mm, yeah, but most people continue our program, so they don't stop. But stopping the drugs, I mean, that's just boom, you stop the drugs, it's 100% stopped, stopped, stopped. All right, so uh, you can expect to regain your weight essentially always when you stop the drugs. You're not going to regain the weight on our program because you look good, feel well, and you love the food. And that's why our compliance data, which we have, we have this. Our compliance data, it shows that somewhere near 85% of people are compliant with the McDougal diet for a year. The data, I looked it up, the data on the ozempic, oh, excuse me, on the semaglutides, take that ozempic word back, on the semaglutides, the, the, uh, the com compliance is only 50%. Half the people have stopped, they've had it, they're not gonna do it anymore. They're tired of throwing up. You know, they're tired of being sick all the time. They're tired of uh, the loss of food noise. They'd like the food noise to come back so that they can enjoy their food. Yeah, that's what the data shows. Uh, medical oversight? No. Nah. I mean, when you're changing your diet, getting off your drugs, yeah, on the McDougall program, we insist you have some medical oversight. 
But uh, on, on the semaglutides, you have oversight like frequently, forever. These are dangerous drugs. Not that a doctor is going to stop any of the problems that happen to you unless they stop the drugs. You can't treat the side effects. There's no, no uh, medication that is anti-nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea to counteract the desired effects of the semaglutides. But, uh, no such drugs. You, no combination of drugs that will accomplish this. So anyway, medical oversight you need, life-threatening adverse effects, none, many. I mean, you read the list of contraindications, pancreatitis, thyroid cancer, uh, you go on and on and on. Uh, drugs that debilitate or kill people. And we're not talking, we're, we're talking about real serious causes of death. You know, not the heart attacks and the breast cancer, and the colon cancer. These folks that semi-glutide are going to still get, maybe at a reduced, uh, at a reduced uh, frequency of occurrence because they're eating maybe 20% less food but they're still eating 80% of the bad diet that gives you heart attacks and cancer. And, and yeah. And, but that 20% is enough to get these people off uh, out of their diabetes. And that's of course, why these drugs were originally invented was because they're diabetic drugs. They lower blood sugar, but they also found out they caused weight loss. All right. So uh, reduces core morbid diseases. Nah. Not, not the not the semiglutides. I told you they're still eating eighty percent of the diet that uh, that gave Americans the uh, the sickness level they had. So maybe they're twenty percent less common. All right. But in our program, the goal of our program is to stop to cure your chronic comorbid diseases, heart disease, diabetes, excess body weight, constipation, indigestion. Yeah, that's our job. Well, like constipation and digestion are really cold morbid diseases. They're, they won't kill you. Well, they may, may make you feel like you're dead, but they won't kill you. Whereas heart attacks and cancer and diabetes will. And eating less of the bad food is going to help a little bit. Planet friendly, excuse me. You, you may have already visited my website on diet and climate change. If not, here's the time to write it down. It's uh, mcdougallfoundation.org, not com. It's mcdougallfoundation.org. Go there, you'll see Mary's and Heather's and my effort to, um, <clears throat> to help people change to a diet that'll help save the planet. It won't save the planet, no way. To save the planet, we gotta do something else. And this is where I want you to keep your pencil out because the only opportunity I've seen to save planet Earth, and I, I look at look for this for, with a passion, is, is a, an approach using mirrors to reflect the heat, the sunlight off the planet. Yi Tao, who I've interviewed, and uh, it's a worthwhile interview. You look up Yi Tao, uh, T-A-O, Yi Tao, and McDougal. You'll find an interview, an hour long interview I did with him in July, two years ago. So we've had a relationship for a long time. Now, where you find out about this is you go to uh, Mir, spelled M-E-E-R.org. So if you want to get in on a movement that's got to start to save this place, you really need to visit this website, mirror.org. Okay, so a, a little extra added promotion here for something I care about a lot, because I've got children and grandchildren, and I imagine many of you have similar concerns. So our diet is planet-friendly. Planet the Ozempic approach is planet-destructive. Live Animals' lives, you know, we show kindness and compassion to the the food industry the animal food industry we think it should stop you know not only to help the those animals but to help wildlife you know wildlife like you know elks and deer and buffalo and so on have been displaced to a serious level by the production of farm animals they've taken over their living space anyway the semaglutides if you're interested in in animal welfare, ladies and gentlemen, you would never take this approach over the McDougall approach. So there's a chart, a summary, hopefully you can use it. We're, we're working on it and making it more reader friendly. And you could share with, with friends. You can say, look, these are the reasons. These are the reasons I've chosen another path. And you might want to too. It's not like you can't take the semi-glutides, you can. In fact, I have two really close friends, actually they're even closer than friends, 
who uh, are medical doctors who practice our kind of medicine a bit, not totally. They still give you the advantage of standard medical care, including prescribing uh, semi-glutides to their patients in addition to the diet. So, you know, that's that's what, what you might want to do. And you might sell it to these friends and relatives with that approach. Look, okay, you can still take your Ozempic, Wegova, et cetera. And I know you have this food noise, and I know you have no confidence in yourself. You think you're the problem, or we're trying to convince you you're not the problem. The problem's the food, but you're not hearing that. So, so we'll give you a, a little of these medications. And at the same time, you'll change to what you should be on, the McDougal diet, a starch-based diet. Let's, let's, let's go a little bit generic because it offends fewer people. No, I, I've, I've discovered that uh, for right, right reasons, uh, other organizations don't like programs that carry a name, like Atkins diet or Pritikin diet or McDougal diet. Why? Because they want to invent their own program. These universities, these uh, health insurance companies, they'll invent their own program and they'll call it whatever they want to call it. And they'll look back and they'll forget the fact that they initially denied the value of a starch-based program. And then in the second phase, they said, well, we know the starch-based program works, but nobody will follow it. To the third phase of the development of an idea where they eventually say, yeah, it's true. And it's important. And after all, we discovered it ourselves 15 years ago. So that's why they don't like name programs. But you know what? We've invested a lot in the name McDougal. You know, we worked on it for 47 years and we're not going to change. But you may be offended by the fact that we give it a, a personal family name. So call it a starch-based diet. That's what it is. Low-fat starch-based diet. A very low-fat starch-based diet. Okay, uh, Chef AJ, I've taken more time than I planned. But I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go on to a brief discussion that's really relevant about why we're starch eaters. I, I mean, there's a whole lecture that I gave you a couple of years ago, a two-hour lecture about why the human being is a starch eater. And what I'd like to do is give you the, uh, the historical evidence, the evolutionary evidence as to why we are starch eaters. And that comes about because of a... A study that was just published. This came out, what is it, uh, January of 2024. How more recent can you get? You know, people say, oh, Dr. McDougall, you just you just, uh, you just, just uh, use old data. Probably out of date. Well, I, what I tried, made a great effort to do is to show you that the truth is the truth and the truth don't change. The truth don't change. This guy that won the Grammys last night, Mary was telling me, uh, what, what's his name, Mary? LaCroix. LaCroix won a Grammy, that's his, or at least not, as far as I know, the origin of that statement. Why do you keep saying the same thing over and over again? They asked LaCroix. He says, because the truth don't change. And that's why I keep saying the same thing over and over again. The truth don't change. And the truth is simple and easy to understand. Okay, so this study recently came out. It's about a population of people that... Uh, date back six to 10,000 years or more. And uh, they looked at the, uh, what they look at, uh, well, somehow or another, they either are the body parts or, anyway, they looked at, the, at the, uh, probably hair and, and bones. And they looked at the, um, the racial plant animal food intake. And they found that this population of people, six, eight, 10, 12,000 years ago, in this part of the world, South America, ate a diet that was mostly plant foods. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, anyway, mostly plant foods. You can read it. I put the references down for you. Just came out. But let's look at some of the data I've given you before that you, uh, that hopefully you appreciate it. Now, the first question you might want to ask is, why people believe we were meat eaters in the past? Why do they keep throwing up the hunter-gatherer stuff? You know that, and telling people that we were, we're hunters, we're, we're we're primarily male-dominated hunters, as far as that's how we fed people in the past. Well, it has to a lot to do with this book by Lauren Cordain, who happens to be a very unhealthy-looking person. I don't know if he's maybe he's changed to a starch-based diet since I saw him last time, but anyway, Lauren Cordain, 
I've read his book thoroughly. I've done a critique on him. You can read the newsletter on the paleo diet and you will find out what I said about this approach and this man, man's work. And I don't personally, I never personally attack people, uh, just their ideas and their work. Anyway, uh, what, what Lauren Cordain tried to convince you and many of you bought into it was that the di previous diet of the human being was uh, a diet primarily of meat because we're hunter gatherers with an emphasis on hunting. That's what the book taught. That's what you tried to learn. And this diet does some good things. It eliminates dairy and refined foods, sugars. That's good. But you get to eat as much meat as you want. In fact, you can eat meat to the point of protein poisoning, which will kill you. When you get up to 35% of your calories as protein, you risk death. It's called rabbit starvation or salmon starvation. Because these are such high protein foods, so low in carbohydrate that you reach a level of protein toxicity. You have, uh, anyway, it'll kill you or could kill you. So uh, anyway, that, that's one of the reasons that you bought, it, bought into this. But if you look at the research, which I'm going to go through right now, it says something different than archaeologists were discovering 70, 80 years ago. No, actually more than 40 years ago, because the new technology is only about 40 years old. Uh, what, what archaeologists would do is they would investigate uh, various sites, archaeologic sites, you know, like villages that people lived in, and they would look for uh, uh, remnants of the way that they used to live. And what they'd find is they'd find bones, and often the bones would have uh, knife cuts in them. And then they find the knives, which were made usually of, of stone. And so that's all they found is they found bones and, and they found bones and uh, uh, stones, you know, knives and axes and so on. Uh, instruments of killing. And so the conclusion was, is that we're obviously predominantly hunters. But what they didn't think about, and archaeologists do today, and they actually publish exactly what I'm telling you. This was the problem. What they didn't think about was the fact that pea pods, corn husks, beans, rice kernels, they don't last 12,000 years. Hey, they deteriorate, they, they're gone. They're organic material, they're gone. They overlooked that. So they started looking for evidence of uh, people eating things that are organic, you know, grains and vegetables and legumes, et cetera. Now, how do you find that evidence? Well, they did it in various ways. And I'm gonna go through some of the ways with you. And I'm gonna show you the populations and I'm gonna show you the research. You know, it's in the bottom right-hand corner. It's for you to look up. And what it's uh, going to talk to you about is various populations that have followed a starch-based diet, all right? So you you can you could further each one of these slides, you probably study a month, each one of these societies, societies probably a year, probably a lifetime. Uh, they're really important, these societies that I'm going to share with you right now, where they looked at uh, other evidence besides besides bones and stones. <laughs> bones and stones, that would be a, a good way to identify paleo, paleo eaters, bones and stones. Anyway, like, for example, uh, in Africa, 1,700 years ago, there's this cave. And uh, what they discovered is these people lived on a starch called the yellow star flower. And they also lived on root vegetables. Root vegetables, you know, like bulbs and corns. And uh, they didn't have potatoes back then. I suppose they might have had sweet potatoes. I'm not sure. They had them in the Caribbean and sweet potatoes were uh, in New Zealand, that part of the world. But anyway, they, they, they had other kinds of root vegetables that they lived on. And let's see, does it tell how they found these and these people? Anyway, I, uh, they probably looked at starch granules. All right. Well, let's go on to another population. Let's see. Here's, sorry, folks. Here is a study of people living in uh, Mozambique. And you see, I gave you a map there to see where that one is. Mozambique, and they found evidence of starch eating based upon starch granules that were found on their tools. And what they find, you can see the starch granules on the left. You could actually identify the kind of starch that 
that they were eating based upon the architecture of their granules. Anyway, they found these on their tools. They found them uh, between their teeth, et cetera. And they lived, they lived on a plant food-based diet. You know, sojourn grasses provided a good share of their starch. Uh, Neanderthals, you know, when you think of Neanderthals, you go, oh, but the ultimate meat eater. Uh, the uh, Neanderthal is pictured as, as somebody with big teeth, big jaws, and uh, <clears throat> being primarily killers, hunters. But looking at uh, the, the granules between their teeth, uh, the calculi, there's, you know, calculus, you know, that the buildup material that occurs between your teeth. What they found is they found starch granules. And uh, th these starch granules uh, go back as far as 600,000 years, that, this finding. Anyway, Neanderthals carb loaded, helping grow big brains. They didn't get it from eating meat. You don't get big brains from eating fat or fish fat or meat. You get it from eating starch. A beautiful paper on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another way that they found out what people ate a long time ago, like Neanderthals, is they looked at their poop. Uh, petroliths, they're called. And what they mean is the poop they got turned into a rock, petrol rock. They found with starch granules. So Neanderthals lived on starch primarily, uh, you know, 230,000 years ago to about 30,000 years ago when they were wiped off the planet by whatever reason. Starch eaters. Now, right, as the Neanderthal population covers uh, a great number of latitudes. And those uh, people that were Neanderthals that lived close to the Mediterranean, they were more dominantly starch eaters. Those who lived up towards the, the, the chilly northern seas, the Arctic, uh, they ate more, more animal foods, as, as every population did. But the bulk of the Neanderthals were starch eaters. Uh, let's see, this is in Turkey. Okay, Turkey, the world's oldest temple. Oldest temple. They found uh, vats full of porridge and stew made from bulgur at least 4,000 years ago. You know, uh, to hunt animals is a big deal. You know, it takes a long time to find something that you're able to kill. And then to bring that dead body back to the, to the village without it rotting was a big chore. No refrigeration, no dry ice. You know, it was a big deal. And so it ended up being a very, very, very small part of any village's diet, except for those in the extremes of latitude, like, for example, the near Eskimo, et cetera. Oh, well, there are a few other exceptions. Anyway, the, there you go. The, the oldest temple in history, they are starch eaters. Uh, here, uh, this, is, this is important because I told you that mostly what they find archaeologists is inorganic, in other words, like stones uh, in, or, or elements, they find mostly inorganic material, bones and stones. And, and I'll show you how they went out and found starch granules and poop and calculi of the teeth. But otherwise, uh, most of the organic material is gone, but it wasn't gone in this place. This is a, a, a village that was discovered south of Santiago, Chile. And it was a village covered by peat moss. It was a peat bog. And this is organic material, and it preserved the organic material of these people. Was it uh, like 14,000 years ago? And they found out 45 edible plants and 22 that were used for medicinal purposes based on organic material. Uh, this is a trip that we took, uh, well, probably been 20 years now. We took about, um, oh, quite a few. We took quite a few people uh, to South America down the uh, the Amazon River and we really had a good time. And part, part of our explanation was to take us to Lake Titicaca. And here's a picture of us at Lake Titicaca. In fact, as those of you who know her can recognize Ann Wheat. You see Ann Wheat there? She's in the, in the blue top, all right? So Ann and Larry and Mary and I, we're walking around on this island made of reeds that floats in this lake. So they don't have much place to exercise. It floats on a lake. 
Well, anyway, Larry and I were walking around, and I'm sure Larry would, wouldn't want me to tell this story because he found me embarrassing. <laughs> Surprising, right? I, I went up, I, got, I isolated one of the families, and I talked to the man, and I said, uh, you know, the, most of the men here are pretty darn trim and healthy looking. I said, how come your women are so fat? You know, it was a contradiction to everything I just told you. Why are they so fat? And you know what the man's answer was? We live on this little island and there's no, no place to exercise. And besides that, we live on a lake where we eat fish. So they weren't on a starch-based diet. Not, not, not totally, certainly not. Anyway, I won't get into gender issues, but okay. Uh, uh, Peru, again, we'll go back to Peru. This is in the Western part of Peru. You find teeth. See those teeth in the left-hand side, the, kind of, the, the brownish picture? Those are teeth there, okay? And between the teeth, they found these granules. These are starch granules. These are from squash and beans and peanuts and grains. All right. You want more? Okay. How about the Iceman? Uh, Ortez the Iceman, found in the Alps of northern Italy. As the glaciers melt, as they seem to be doing these days, folks. Remember, the website I want you to visit is mer, M E E R, dot org. If you want any chance of making things right, and visit Dr. McDougall's website, uh, McDougallFoundation.org. We need this. We've got to change the diet of the planet. All right, get back to the 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 uh, uh, the, the uh, ice man. And what they did is they examined uh, the hair, and they found that he was. When you examine the hair or the bones, you find what people's long term diet is. You look in their stomach, you see what they ate the next the previous meal, and they found meat in his stomach. But when you analyze the hair, what you find is that this man was vegan. Essentially, pretty much all of his diet came from plant foods. Uh, this, this is a, a good one. This is the Tolan man. This man was also found in a peat bog. So he was well-preserved, very organic material. And uh, he lived, what, about 400 years BC. And uh, what, it, what it found is that he'd been killed about, about a day or two. Uh, before they, be, you know, he'd be killed about a day or two before they, before he died, or they started killing him. They hanged him. <laughs> I guess, I guess they did kill him. They hanged him, uh, and uh, so he died suddenly. And they looked at the meal in his stomach, and his last meal was eighty-five percent barley, a little fish, and some flaxseed. And you know, what does that tell you? This is a star cheater. Yeah. Are you getting the Are you getting the rhyme and rhythm here, folks? <laughs> Uh, Polynesians, you know, Mary and I are from Hawaii, 15 years. The program was developed in Hawaii. So I had an interest in looking back at the diet of, of the people who uh, originally migrated to Hawaii, the Polynesians. And their diet was taro and breadfruit and, and uh, some vegetables. And they, they, even after the missionaries came, and the missionaries brought the pigs. Okay, even after the missionaries came, came they only ate the pigs for celebration. And sacrifice. All right, so the 1800s, the missionaries brought the chickens and pigs and dogs for people to eat. But prior to that, they were pretty close to 100% star teachers for an occasional dead animal that was fresh enough to eat that they found. Uh, I like this one. This is important because these are Native Americans. We ought to have pride in Native Americans, indigenous populations of people. Really, come on. <clears throat> Everybody else is an immigrant, right? Uh, there was an uh, archaeologic study of an area called the Four Corners of the United States. This is where four states stick together in corners, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. At that particular junction, that area of the world, they found something that they later named the Four Corners Potatoes. That was 10, 12,000 years ago. You know, there are a lot of these uh, uh, native populations that lived on corn especially later on. And by the way, I hand out this coin. This is a dollar, a dollar coin that came out about 10 years ago. And it is an honor to Native Americans. Uh, it honors a very famous uh, princess. And I'm going to try and pronounce her name. 
sounds silly when I, if I did Sacagawea. wheel. How about that? Close. <laughs> anyway, and you see on the tail side of the coin what she's doing. She's tending her three sisters, corn, beans, and rice. That's the diet of real Americans. Uh, you all know Dan Butner. Have you had him on your show yet? Did you? Yes, I've had him on many times, actually. He's wonderful. Yeah, then you all know him. Uh, he wrote a very, very important article in National Geographic, which subsequently became a national best-selling book. It was about populations of people where there were an extraordinary number of, of folks who lived over 100 years of age. You know, I don't know what the general increase in life expectancy was, but there were a lot of people that were 100 or greater. And these were places like Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikira, Greece, and Loma Linda, California. It was a seven-day Adventist. Well, uh, you know, uh, in this article, of course, Dan has always described it as a primarily plant food-based diet. But one morning, uh, Mr. Butner and I were having breakfast together alone. And we're talking about the, uh, the conclusions that he came to. And I asked him, I said, Dan, you know, have you ever considered one other unifying idea for all these populations? I said, these people are all starch eaters. And for, you know, the next couple of articles I saw him published, he actually referred to them as being starch eaters. They're all starch eaters. That's why I emphasize starch so much to you. Somebody came up to me at a dinner that we're at on uh, Friday night and asked me, in, in a sense, could you tell me what I'm doing wrong and what I do to fix the problem? I said, you are a starch eater. There's your sentence. That's why you're wrong. Until you get the concept through your mind, that you're a starch eater, you're a starch a starchitarian, that your diet should be like 70 to 90% starch and the rest preferably fruits and vegetables with no animal foods at all. But if you choose to eat animals, that's that's a choice you have to personally make. It not necessarily will detract from your health. It depends on the frequency of which you <clears throat> divulge in these evil habits. Did I say that? All right, all right. So anyway, uh, this is a... Uh, has to do with longevity. Uh, nice comparison, same, same genetic makeup, the Okinawans and the people who live on the mainland of Japan. And what you find is the Okinawans eat uh, 80, excuse me, uh, the Okinawans eat 83% uh, of fewer calories, 83% of the calories as the people in Japan. So, but how do they eat those 83% calories less without being hungry all the time? Well, the way that they do it is because they eat a diet that is much heavier in starch, sweet potatoes and rice, than the people who live on the mainland of, of uh, Japan, the Okinawans do. And what's, what's the consequence? The consequence is in general, they live five years longer through restricting of calories. They eat 83% of the calories, but not by being hungry, not by dieting but by changing the kind of food. Starches are very low in calories comparatively to meat and dairy and oil. That's how they did it. They didn't eat less, they ate more, more rice. More, excuse me, more sweet potatoes in particular. All right, uh, soldiers in uh, ancient Rome, they would ask their, their uh, leaders to not serve meat prior to battle, because they understood if they ate meat prior to battle, they were not as strong a warriors. They're likely to get killed. So don't feed us any meat, leader. They knew this back then, a good grief. You know, they're talking about far more than 2000 years ago. And uh, the world was conquered. The, the known world was conquered twice by Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. And they did it on a diet of corn. Now, they didn't mean maize, which is what you may think of as corn. They meant corn as to, in terms of soybeans and wheat and rice and so on, but not maize. That's, uh, maize didn't come over from uh, South America, Central America until the 1700s. And well, anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to give you all the dates you can look them up. So, so again, Conquered the known world on a diet of starch. 
Well, you, you could probably already figure this out. Can you imagine an army of 100,000 people going through a countryside and finding enough animals to feed these men? Ah, they had to raid the villages and steal their crops. And these crops were starches. And that's how they conquered the known world, is on starch. Uh, you well, Just some general statements here. When I say people from Asia, you say rice, although they've eaten lots of other starches. Uh, when I talk to you about uh, people from Central America and Mexico, you go, well, these are the people of the corn. They've been eating corn for like ever. You know, at least 9,000 years and probably 13,000 years they've eaten a diet of corn. And, and they've had babies. They've run athletic events. They had battles on corn. Maize as a source of energy. Uh, if you look at the, the studies done on uh, mummified uh, remains of the Middle East, you find that the diet of these people was a diet of wheat and barley. Well, the Middle East, you know, e Egypt, Iran, Iraq, and so on, that has a, a name associated with it. It's called the breadbasket of the world. Bread, bread, bread basket of the world. It's not called the, the tri-tip basket of the world. Their diet was primarily wheat and barley. And you look at Papua New Guinea, over 92% of their diet came from sweet potato leaves and roots, mostly roots. That's where the calories came from. You know, the diet is about three to 6% protein, lower than many of your experts think that a population could live on, yet they lived on that particular diet for, you know, a long time, I think it was 50,000 years. Check the figures, doesn't matter. Low cholesterol, you would die to have lab tests that looked like these people. Excellent health results. Living on a diet, primarily sweet potatoes, starch eaters. Now, I want to talk to you about a man. Uh, did you ever see this uh, this, ev this event, uh, AJ, when uh, and Nathan, uh, Nathan yes. Dominey talked? Yes, yes. He, he, you had him say on the very last night that the human all right, beings. All right. Don't, don't tell the story now. Okay. So uh, Chef AJ was had a chance to meet Nathaniel Dominey, who's a, a big shot. Uh, this guy's really important in the archaeologic fields. He's now at Dartmouth. He's an anthropologist and ev evolutionary uh, biologist. And he, along with his colleagues, published a paper that you ought to read in Nature Genetics in 2007. And it was about how the, the uh, primate's genome, genetic material, changed as we evolved from lesser primates to homo sapiens. Now, I know some of you don't believe in evolution. Mm, let's not go there. All right, I'm a scientist. So uh, <clears throat> I know you don't like that either. So anyway, um, what uh, his group came to was the conclusion that lesser primates, chimpanzees and uh, gorillas, for example, they're trapped to living near the equator because they have to have food all year long. And that means they have to live in a place where fruits and vegetables, perishable vegetables, uh, grow all year long, including the wintertime. And uh, as a result, they didn't have to have a genetic makeup to produce enzymes that digest starch much. But, but as, as we changed and as we went from lesser primates to, I don't know why you call them greater primates, I guess you shouldn't, couldn't, to homo sapiens, what, what happened was they increased the number of genes in their, you know, their DNA, their genetic uh, genome, they increase the number of genes that produce an enzyme which digests starch. That's its only job. Uh, they digest amylase, which is starch. And we went from lesser, lesser primates, which had two copies of the starch-based, uh, of, the, of the gene to make uh, a starch digestion enzyme, to humans where they have somewhere between six and 16 copies of this enzyme. So now what happened is the primate could leave the equator because they didn't have to depend upon the, the fruits and vegetables in the wintertime. They could go north and south. And when fall and winter and early spring came, they just dug under the ground and found starch, which is what they survived on as they migrated uh, north and south. The, the homo sapien has taken over the planet for good or bad. All right, so this is uh, the, the story that uh, Nathaniel Dominey tells us. And I just want to share with you, you know, as, as kind of a parting comment to my presentation, 
what he said to uh, Chef AJ and I, uh, a few hundred other people at this weekend, uh, uh, one of the, and we would call them advanced study weekends, but a lot of people came for various reasons, advanced study weekends. And so what, what do we tell our, uh, our friends and relatives who tell us that we're primarily eat, meat eaters because we're hunter gatherers? <laughs> with an emphasis on hunter because that's you know the man thing to do and gathering is the woman thing to do that's uh that's a myth hunters and gatherers the majority of their calories come from plant foods yeah. so that's, that's a myth so, uh, hunters and gatherers the majority of all the calories that any hunting and gathering population gets comes from its plant foods so that's that's what's most reliable uh, meat is just too unpredictable you can't you can't rely on it so kind of it kind of as a, as a, as a summary statement uh, as an expert anthropologist, uh, you know, you, you've spent your whole life studying the human diet and its relationship to teeth and bones and chemicals and genes and so on. Your conclusion is the human being is a... Starchivore. <laughs> can, can I, could I uh, use that in my new book? Okay. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Excellent. Thank you. Well, see, this is this is just a case of sexism, gender bias. It's existed, as far as I know, in all of humankind, the way men treat women. Uh, you know, the men, they get the glory. They go and hunt. They're lucky if they get um, something to bring back to the village. I told you why. Animals are difficult to catch. And to preserve during the long trip back is near impossible. The calories for a village to survive were obtained from the work of the children and grandparents and women. They get no, no credit. Why? Why? <laughs> because of gender bias, sexism. There, there's an, uh, an interesting study of lesser primates that I probably shouldn't share with you, but I will. <clears throat> And that's a study on uh, on uh, monkeys. I don't know what variety of monkeys they were, but they did a study on monkeys where they showed that they would go out. And monkeys are not strict vegans. They they have you know they have these fangs, these teeth, so that they can capture little animals. You have you don't have any of those though, do you? Because you shouldn't be out capturing little animals. Anyway, they capture little animals. And they're not very good at it, and you know they. Uh, Anyway, they would catch a little animal and they bring it back to the village. The reward, okay, the reward they were looking for was not necessarily to feed the village, not to improve the nutrition of the diet of that village. They brought the little animal back to win the favors of the females. And do you know what they wanted in return? I guess that's that. I, that's why you should call me a misogynist, right, JJ? Because <laughs> I told you that story. All right. Anyway, uh, I, I've talked to you about this before. This is something that's so undeniable, and that is that uh, human history tells us that all large populations of people, I'm talking about all large, the word large is important, all large populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history you can dream different dreams if you want. But when you look at the science and the evidence, verifiable human history, all large successful populations of people throughout verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. I gave you the worldwide picture. You know, you may want to focus on the exceptions like the Inuit Eskimo, probably 60,000 individuals <laughs> whose average uh, lifespan was like 25 years. We had a really tough life, if you want, and the only food that was available was, was mammals and fish. Yeah, you could talk about that all you want, but you don't live there. You don't live there in those times when you have to go hunting for your food every day. You know, a time when you lived in an igloo and had to burn calories to keep warm. If you're uh, of that population of people today, like, for example, if you live in Alaska today, you go fishing with a green lure. In other words, you drive through a drive through line at your favorite restaurant, and you hand the, the person behind the counter a green lure. Well, they give you a fish sandwich. That's how you get your fish these days. And of course, they'll give you a mammal sandwich too. 
and an avian sandwich too, if you want. In fact, McDonald's now serves what they call, I think, a, uh, it's it's a, a land, sea, and uh, avian or land, land, sea, and what is it? Land, sea, and air. Thank you, Mary. Land, sea, and air burger. That's that's one of their new topics. And of course, they have a slice from beef and a slice from poultry and a slice from fish. You buy one sandwich, you know, like 1,300 calories, just one sandwich, near 50% fat, one sandwich. You wonder why the people who live in, Eskimo, in, in Alaska today are some of the fattest, sickest people on the planet? You know, they ride around in heated SUVs and they end up living in homes that have a temperature of 76 degrees. Not an igloo anymore. You don't live that way. If you did, if you did, lived in an igloo and had to catch all your own food, guess what? You wouldn't want to hear about McDougal or it wouldn't do you any good because you can't eat the McDougal diet in this uh, environment. Yeah. Anyway, the people, uh, we have quite a few people from Alaska who are our patients and uh, professionals, dentists, doctors, and so on. And they tell us about the poor health of these, these folks who live there. And it's all a result of change in diet. All right. No, I don't think I'll go into this. Shh. Done. You don't want me to talk about... Uh, uh, anyway. I... Wait, what, what, what don't you want to go into? Well, I was going to go into a couple studies that one that you only need... I, you know, what I try and do in the five o'clock session, AJ, is I, five o'clock Sundays... Mary and I are on, Mary and I and Heather are on for an hour every Sunday, but not next Sunday. What I try and do is I try and tell people about articles that have shown, that I've shown interest in over the previous week. Now, again, I kind of got started with the idea, well, McDougal, why is your data, your research, your references 10, 20 years old? Well, that's when I wrote the paper. It was 10 or 20 years ago. What would you expect me to use? And what I try and share with people are, you know, the ideas I came to. You know, 30, 40, sometimes 47 years ago, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, when I lived on the sugar plantation back in 1972, 51 years ago, 52 years ago, I started coming to these conclusions. Anyway, uh, I try and bring you up to date. And so I, I listed a couple articles. One, the idea that if you only exercise 15 minutes a day, I think that was a day. I don't know. I, I think it was a day, 15 minutes a day. Uh, that That's enough exercise to reduce your risk of dying of a heart attack and dying overall. And then the other paper that interested me came out of the New York Times. It was an article about taking birth control pills destroys your sex drive. And I tried to explain to people that, you know, as a general doctor, I, I take care of families and, you know, family units, husband and wife would come in. Sometimes the woman alone would come in. Never, I don't ever remember a man <laughs> come in with these kinds of uh, questions, but no reason that he couldn't have. They, they would ask me about my preferred method of birth control. What do you re recommend as a general doctor for birth control? And by the way, as a husband and a father, uh, what would I recommend uh, for birth control? And my, my, my uh, recommendations kind of went as follows. The most effective way to for birth control is abstinence. That's it. But, you know, okay, that's not acceptable. I understand. And probably the second safest thing to do is use a barrier, like a condom or a, uh, a cervical uh, barrier, or cervical condoms that they have for women. <clears throat> and uh, you know that's that's pretty safe, but not as effective as effective. And then probably the next thing to do would be. Well, I, I should have added the rhythm method in there. That, that, that goes after absence. The rhythm method, where which is a method where they call people parents. You've heard that joke. So then you do a barrier method after that, and then maybe an IUD might be considered to be safest, uh, plus an IUD and all these other ways, abstinence, barriers, uh, you know, IUD, all these don't mess with your hormones. Okay, but birth control pills do. They mess with your hormones and they, uh, for one part of it, because you're adding estrogen and progesterones, which are in counterbalance to testosterone, it decreases your testosterone. But the other reason that I give is more general. The reason you have a heightened sex drive 
mid cycle, you know, 14 days after your first period, after your period. The reason you have this mid cycle is because that's when you're most fertile. And the intention of intercourse is to produce offspring. So the body does everything it can to enhance this purpose, which is a mid cycle surge in interest in sex. Not, not, not just in the woman, but also the man, which is appreciated by changes in physical appearance and body odor. So the whole couple experience a diminution, diminishment, that's probably easier to say, diminishment, diminishment of uh, their, their sexual interest in each other. Hey, <laughs> that wouldn't please me at all. So I would inform them of that. I say, well, okay, you can take birth control pills. But you're going to lose. You're going to lose this, and you know I, I've always considered that an important part of a relationship between a man and a woman is their mutual communication during lovemaking. Anyway, a little added information for you. Of course, birth control pills are the safest way to not get pregnant, but they cause major changes. They increase your risk of breast cancer, they increase your risk of uterine cancer, increase your risk of probably gallbladder disease. Uh, this is not an innocuous situation to take these medications. But, you know, if you if you consider the, the benefits versus the harms, that's what you as a family unit may come to the conclusion for. But I, as a doctor, just have an obligation to inform you of what I see in terms of benefits and risk. And you decide. I mean, it's, really, it's up to you. you know, I'm not going to tell you uh, what... 52 years of a wonderful marriage has resulted in my personal life. But we'd have to have a whole another show for us to do that. Dedicate a whole hour to that one. <laughs> As you all can tell, Mary and I have been happily married for a long time, well, 52 yeah, years. Yeah, Dr. McDougall, there's a, a very personal question in, in the chat. I put yeah. it in the chat. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask it, so. Right. Well, ask you know, since I'm not a misogynist, you can ask me anything. Oh, I mean, I, this is so embarrassing, but I'm going to say it. Aaron says, <laughs> I can't believe this. Do you and Mary still do it? Oh, my God. I can't believe I asked that. No, and you won't get an answer either. It's none of your damn business. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I, can I, I, I can tell you. Okay. I'm so sorry. I, I, can tell you, I, tell, I can tell you one thing for sure is I find Mary very attractive in many, many ways. And, uh, you know, as far as what happens these days in the bedroom, none of your damn business. <laughs> but the important thing is, how do I, how do I appreciate her? I, I appreciate her different than I did 52 years ago. You know, I had a, a whole bunch of different desires and needs and opportunities and stuff 52 years ago. Now, I, now I'm 76 years old. I'm retired. And we have different interests in life. We have grandchildren and but I'll just end it with a general statement. My sex life has not ended. <sighs> okay. I'm so sorry to have asked. I mean, it no, was... it's okay. It's okay. It's a fair question. But to tell you, I'm not going to tell you is a fair answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just, just, just know that I ain't dead yet. <gasps> absolutely. So you, you mentioned birth control pills are, are effective. What about just condoms? Much less effective. Much Why? Less... Because they fall off, they break. And yeah. sometimes... Sometimes it's been known that men will fool their partners and say, oh, I got it on, but I don't. <laughs> you know, it, it, going, going back to the first part of your talk, I, I seem to remember the number $17,000. Is that for, how how long does that person get these weight loss? It, 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 it lasts, it takes 68 weeks. So you divide 68 by 52, and I think you get 1.4. So it's 1.4 years or, oh, you know, a little over a year and a third, a little over a year and four months. And do it, does, do it, are insurance companies paying for these drugs at all? Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes. That, I uh, mean, I think about my car, which is a nice Toyota and it's, it's still running and it, it didn't cost $17,000. Oh, this is crazy. I mean, you can get a car. I, 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 I mean, is this true, Dr. McDougal? Somebody said that even when insurance companies will pay for the drug, they have to show an overweight BMI. So when they get to a normal BMI, they won't pay for them anymore. But my understanding is even when their BMI is normal, they still have to keep taking the drug. They do. Yeah, and once you stop the drug, you regain the lost weight, count on it. Because the only reason you're staying thin is because you're too sick to eat. 
Wow. So once you remove that, your normal natural appetite returns and you eat. And if you don't know about a starch-based diet, if you still believe that you need to eat meat to get your your protein and dairy to eat your get your calcium and you know fish to get your omega-3 fats, if you still are into that story, which is a story. <laughs> Oh man, it's, I'll tell you, they made that one up. They fooled the public and over the last, well, that started uh, in 1850. <clears throat> so it's a nice, really good lecture uh, uh, Jeff Nelson gives on his family history. Did you ever hear, hear that? You should have Jeff Nelson on. I'm, I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah, I think I've interviewed him before. Uh, sure. Well, he came, he came from one of the big meat companies. So I think it was... I'm not going to mention the name, but anyway, one of the one of the big meat producers, his family, that's where the family money came from. And he'll tell you about it. He'll tell you about his grandfather and and uh, and so on that uh, really are were big factors in causing the health problems we have today. And Jeff admits it. He gave a talk at one of our advanced study weekends. So, you know, I, uh, this information is public and it's out there and he's, he'd be a great guest. OK, I, I just texted him and asked yeah. him. So. How long have these semi-glutides been around? I would only guess maybe 10 years, fewer than 10 years. They've only been popular the last couple of years. Since, you know, big shots like uh, Elon Musk and Oprah Winfrey have taken on this as uh, part of their weight loss program. Wow. And Oprah looks good. I mean, good grief. I mean, she looks some of the best I've seen pictures of her. And Elon, I'm not going to even comment on. He's, he's, just, he's his own person. But... Uh, the thing that surprises me is people that are so successful and assuming they are also so intelligent. Elon Musk, you know, the richest man in the world who invented the best car ever even dreamed of, sends people out of space on his rockets. Don't tell me he shouldn't know better or doesn't have the capacity to know better. And yet he buys into the Ozempic uh, story. And he, they take them, both of them, and freely admit it. Uh, I think if they were, if, I think if you were get to, were to get them to read that chart, did you have a chance to get that chart up? Uh, yeah, it, yes, yes. All they have to do is click the link and click um, download. They don't need right, it. So yep. print out the chart, send it to 500,000 of your friends. And maybe one of them knows Oprah or Elon Musk or somebody else that's a, a mover and shaker. Maybe, maybe Barack Obama, who, by the way, was one of my students when he was 15 years old. I don't know that you remember that story, but uh, he was one of my students in my health classes at Punahou. But uh, I, I think he would probably buy into that chart in a minute. But we don't want to, I'm, this is not politics, folks. We're just talking about, just talking about celebrities. Well, so... Uh, <clears throat> If they've been that, using I, I, books, I, I, I'm going to have a better version of that chart out that's more readable. So he posted, but there's a tool for you. Just say, do you like to spend a few minutes going over the uh, pluses and minuses of a couple of different programs that are highly successful? They both result in a 20 plus, plus pound weight loss, which is what you want in a year. Do you like to go over some of the pluses and minuses? That chart will help you focus on the positives and negatives. Somebody wrote me this morning. They they said they had a, two sisters that weighed over 400 pounds each. And they tried to introduce McDougal to them and they, they couldn't do it. I mean, they, it's gotten to the point as in a lot of families where they don't even speak anymore because this one sister, she follows our program and she's trying to help her two morbidly obese sisters who are sick with all kinds of comorbid conditions. And it's got resulted as it often does in a family feud. So how do you approach these people like uh, like the sisters here? Well, you know, I would tell them about our program, but talk about what they're into also. Okay, so you're into getting these semi-glutide shots. Well, let's see, you want that 25 pound weight loss? Well, look at what McDougal offers you. You know, you, you, you don't want to plateau, you want to get down to, instead of just like 250 pounds, or excuse me, 350, from 400 to 350, that's what you would accomplish, is about a 50 pound weight loss. You want to do better than that? I mean, you weigh like 400 pounds. You, you think you're going to be much better shape at 350? That's where your plateau hit. That's where if you stop the drugs, you'll be back up to 400 pounds. But would you like to? Would you like to follow a program that respects your health and your personal appearance? 
that it only stops losing when you hit trim body healthy weight. No plateaus. I mean, the plateau is the stomach size meets the hunger drive, meets the 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 the, the calories and fats and other nutrients that the body needs. They they just kind of fit together. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, think about it. Through like uh, 400 billion years of evolution, <laughs> through two and a half million years of Homo sapien evolution, that that things uh, were figured out to the point where we have bumblebees and eagles and buffaloes and human beings. I mean, really, it's just such a cool place to live, isn't it? I look around and I say, I think to myself, particularly in relationship to the climate change, I think. God, what a loss, not just for us, for everybody. Maybe if there are people on other planets. What a loss is Jim, this Jim called planet Earth. It's going, folks. We're saying yeah. that I had to. So, sorry, I'm, I'm getting old. I, I, I'm getting old. I spent 50, 55 years figuring out how to take care of people. And now I'm trying to figure out how to get people to understand. Uh, that diet's important in terms of of the planet. Don't forget Mir now, okay? M E E R dot org. Put it on your put it on your notepad. You won't regret it. You may not like what they have to say right now. You may find a lot of arguments against this approach, but I don't think any of them will stand. It's an all this the problem with Mir is this. It's an all volunteer program. There's no industry. There's no financial interest because there's no way to make money off of this approach. So that's a big reason why this has not come to the public's attention is because nobody can figure out how to make a buck off of it. What they do is they 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 cover a certain proportion of the planet with mirrors that are made of plastic bottles and aluminum cans. You know, the, the consistency of the dumps is they take the things that we throw in the dumps and they turn them into reflective surfaces that radiate the energy back into outer space. And when you lose the heat, then things survive. We don't care if there's CO2 around, it feeds the plants. The problem is the CO2 traps heat. We gotta get rid of the heat and you can do it with mirrors. You know, I saw an article last week, it was kind of interesting. We probably shouldn't, it's not the, the idea of the show, but it gave me a chance to tell you about some of the things I saw there. They have one project that they talked about either in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, where they're going to put this satellite, which has all of these expansive wings on them, reflective wings, up near the sun to reflect a certain amount of the energy off Earth. Now, think about it for a minute. If you're going to take and put a satellite up near the sun, that'd be technologically really difficult. You'd have to be close enough to uh, make a big difference in our atmosphere. And that means you're probably so close you'll burn up. And think about what it would cost to put such a thing up there. And to manage it, if it didn't work out well, what, what would you do? Well, if you put mirrors all over the ground and, and on the water, what do you do? You just turn a mirror over. You want it to be... Uh, <laughs> you want, want the temperature to be 75 degrees instead of 77? Turn a few mirrors over. Change the amount of energy reflected away from the planet. Makes sense to me. You don't have to have a high education to turn over mirrors, folks. We can get everybody, we can get 8 billion people working on this. 86% of these people have smartphones. 8 billion people, 86% have smartphones. That means we can instantaneously communicate messages about diet and it maybe even the mirror project to everybody overnight. Hey, we ain't done yet, folks. I, I hear people talk about, we're finished. There's no opportunity, no chance, no way. I'm, I'm not giving up and you shouldn't either. So, Dr. McDougall, why do you think people don't want to do the diet and want to go and do the drugs? If they think it's easy, do they want to keep eating the foods they're used to? What do you think is the primary driver? 
So you have to talk to Doug Lyle about that. You know, he's much better at it. the things I've observed is it's hard to change. That's why we called the book Making the Change in the beginning. But people don't want to change, no matter what it is. We have this built-in resistance to change. And I, that's probably important for our survival. Uh, there's a lack of education. People don't really know how important food is. We're taught a well-balanced diet. I was taught through medical school and residency, and up, even up to until now, that all we had to do was eat a well-balanced diet. Well, what's a well-balanced diet? Grief. It's pretty much everything and anything you want to stuff in your mouth. We're not communicated the power of dietary change. People think it will make no difference at all. What? You know, why should I bother this effort? It's not going to do anything. Well, I'll tell you, folks, it's going to do far more than you ever imagined. We have, you know, probably 800 people on this on this uh, uh, Zoom presentation that will tell you that. They'll tell you, you know, I went into this and I got far, far, far more than I expected. This is powerful medicine. And they believe in the drug companies, the advertisement. They believe in the food companies. They are, they got all the money. See, so, so they dictate the story. No, diet's not important. We're supposed to eat well. But they dictate the story. It's important to eat protein and calcium and omega-3 fats. They control the story. So that, that's the problem. If we could change the story to the truth, which I believe this is the truth, then, then people would change. At least some of the people would. If even 1% if even changed, it would be worthwhile. See, 1% of 8 billion, uh, you do the math. <laughs> you know, yeah, the opportunities are great through changing the story. Yeah. The other thing is being over fat has become acceptable. And that's what disturbs me as much as anything, is that uh, because of everything you look at, advertisements, TV, you walk in the mall, you know, go go to work, everybody's overweight. It's gotten to the point where this has become the normal to be overweight. I don't believe the people who suffer from being overweight think it's any way normal. They may be resigned to the fact that that's all they're ever going to be is overweight. But it, but it can't be fun to go to the the extra large uh, size racks at a clothing store or to get on an airplane and ask for a seatbelt extender. I can't imagine that being fun. Or having to go to the doctor, you know, every month or so to get your refills. You need, you know, I, I think intelligent people, well-motivated people who like who like themselves. That's that's the other criteria. And, you know, people ask me, you know, through your 55 years of 56 now of caring for people, what have you discovered about whether or not people will change? And there are two things that you must have. You must have the information. A seven-year-old can understand this. I know I've tested it. I've tested on a six-year-old. They can understand it. The other thing is you have to like yourself. There is a big problem. And that will leave to Dr. Doug Lyle. You have to, you have, to have enough self-worth to make improvements. Like, for example, in my life, I decided being a cigarette smoker was not in my best interest. And I like myself a lot. And so, you know, I gave up this habit on October 20th, 1972, at 7 a.m. in the morning. I remember the last cigarette. But I wanted to be, I wanted to be somebody I, I, who could even like even more rather than a stinky, hole burning, atmosphere contaminated smoker. I wanted to be different. So if you care about yourself in the terms of your health and your weight, uh, you're going to seek out the knowledge and you're going to practice it. That's all it requires. Now, how do you instill self-worth in people? Ask Dr. Lyle. I don't know. Well, Dr. McDougall, he's the guest tomorrow, so maybe I will. Dr. McDougall, if these weight loss drugs have been around eight to 10 years, why are they so popular now? What were they originally intended for? And are there long-term side effects from them? They were originally invented for diabetes. Okay, uh, because they make people sick. And because of being sick, you don't eat as much. And because of eating less, 
you lose weight. And because you lost weight, your diabetes goes away. <laughs> that means any way that you lose weight, your diabetes goes away. If you follow our program, which you should do, because that's the most satisfying, effective, lifelong way to do it. You'll get rid of your diabetes. Our, 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 our results are type 2 diabetics are close to 100% are cured. So if, if you go on a low-carb diet, like the Atkins diet, you lose weight. Guess what? Your diabetes gets better. Uh, if you take the semaglutides, you lose weight. Your diabetes gets better and lots of other claims that they have out there, like it, taking these drugs helps Alzheimer's, you know, maybe cancer, certainly heart disease. I mean, the, the marketing team for these uh, semaglutides have extended the range, range of customers to basically anything that's wrong with you. We'll fix it with Ozempic. And you will, because you've lost weight. That's why, not because of any magic thing about these drugs. These drugs don't go in and, and carry on a, and have a component that heals rotten arteries or reverses cellular changes in cancer. They don't have any. All they do is cause you to lose weight. And that's why they brag about these, this approach being so effective with almost anything. You'll get less tooth decay if you if you take semaglutides. Why? Uh, I don't know. Maybe because you less put less crap in your mouth. So, uh, did you ever prescribe these drugs, Doctor McDougal, for diabetes in your patients? Did I ever prescribe them? Never. So but it's only because I my my training came much earlier than these drugs. For diabetes, I initially started with sulfonylureas. Okay, sulfonylureas in 1972. They started putting a, a warning in the physician's desk reference that if you take sulfonylureas, this is based on the university diabetic study, 1972, okay, it was done actually in the 60s, but published in 1972. If you take these drugs compared to a control population that doesn't take the drugs, that's all they do different. You know, better or worse, they just don't take the drug. You increase your risk of dying of heart disease by two and a half times. So, so right in the physician desk reference. Okay, so I started out prescribing sulfonylureas, and uh, then uh, then glucophage, metformin, we call it, became popular, and well over half the diabetics today are on are on uh, metformin glucophage, and the reason is, and I'll tell you the reason why is because it's one of the one of the few drugs that doesn't cause you cause you to gain weight. You know, up until we got the semi-glutides, so many of the approaches like giving insulin or giving drugs that increase insulin levels cause you to gain weight because insulin pushes fat into fat cells. So they had to have a, a, so we could sell the public that at least didn't make them fatter. Uh, aggressive treatment of diabetes with sulfonylureas, they cause insulin release. They, and they show that there's a, 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 an average about an 18 pound weight gain after a year from medicine. All right, so we went on to metformin, and then it was claimed that metformin helped with heart disease. The data to support that is almost none, but you know, it was a good story to tell. Uh, review articles on metformin, they can't figure out whether it's good or bad for you in terms of heart disease. Probably bad, though. I think it weighs down on the side of this is not a good drug for heart disease. But you lose weight. By the way, metformin acts similar to semaglutides. Yeah, it causes you nausea, and, and you know, you eat less food. It has that, uh, an effect like semaglutides, metformin does. And you lose weight. And that would be the only reason you improve your risk of dying of heart disease, not because of anything, anything magical about metformin. Good grief. All right, all right. So then we went out, see, insulin was always an option, and it's the one that I still use today to treat type 1.5 and, and type 1 diabetics, never type 2. Type 2 is 100% curable, 100% curable with weight loss. So uh, I, I use, have always used a little insulin in people, and now I use the more long-acting insulins. I didn't have available to me when I started anything but intermediate and short-acting insulin. But now we have long-acting insulin, which, which is, its effects last longer than 24 hours, like Lantus. And I have figured out that I can prescribe one shot of Lantus a day, or maybe two, to control the blood sugar in type 1.5 and, and type 1 diabetics. It simplifies their life. Instead of thinking about their diabetes, 
you know, every hour, every two hours, or, you know, and shots four times a day, they just have to think about it once in the evening. A little poke, go to bed. The rest of the day, they can enjoy their family, their business, their hobbies. You know, there's something about life besides being focused on the medical business, which is what too many people are. Their whole life is dominated by doctor's appointments and refills, and I got to take this pill at nine o'clock and that pill at four o'clock, and wow. Anyway, uh, so I, 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 uh, I, I try and simplify things as much as I can for my patients because I want them to have every chance of having a good life and enjoying their life. Take them off their insulin pumps. I do that. Yes, I do. <laughs> the, the insulin, you know, the, the highest in technology because your whole life is dominated by the insulin pump. You spend your whole day, well, what's your blood sugar? How much insulin do you give yourself? That's what the conversation is in your family units. It's all around that meter. You live the life of a diabetic meter and pump. That's not a quality of life, at least in my opinion. Okay, so anyway, uh, it's gotten to the point where I use insulin only, long acting insulin like Lantus, almost always. You know, rarely I'll have to add some shorter acting insulin and to make it as simple as possible. And uh, have the patients focus on their diabetes as infrequently as they can. And also I make sure that the treatments are not gonna make other conditions worse, except insulin does cause you to gain weight. But you, if you give the person the right dose, it doesn't. If you aggressively treat them, it does. But if you're reasonable, sensible, you're not gonna gain weight on insulin. In fact, you'll, one of the tricks that uh, I hate to pick on teenage girls, it's probably inappropriate, but one of the tricks that uh, teenage girls have found who are type 1 diabetic for controlling their weight is just take less insulin. They just cut back on their insulin because insulin drives fat into fat cells. So they stay trim. Well, okay, is it harmful? Mm, we could talk about that a bit. I, it's not as harmful as you think it is, but it's probably not a good idea to cut back on your insulin. Or at least you can make that argument. <clears throat> anyway, um, that's that's the way I practice now. Always, always a hard focus on diet, and uh, then then we ju judiciously use medications. You know, as as uh, frequently as possible, they cause more good than harm. Well, the reason I'm asking this is I'm trying to ascertain if the people that were taking the semi-glutides for diabetes, are they also taking it for life? I'm scared. Are they also what? Are, are they also taking it for the rest of their lives? If you want to stay it thin. So are, as, soon have, you stop, if you, as soon as you stop the shots or the pills, right. well, I you guess you gain the lost weight. What Why? Because your appetite comes back. The food noise returns. I like food noise. I look forward to lunch and dinner today and I'll feel good all, all the way through my meal. It'll bring me joy. Whereas people who are on these drugs, they dread the next meal. They spend a good share of their life over the toilet, vomiting or diarrhea. Good grief. What I'm asking is, are there any long-term side effects? Remember, oh. Fen people, people did very well Heart on disease. Yeah. Like, like FenFen, uh, they it caused heart valve disease. So went well, off from her. I, so I, I, I don't, I don't know this. I don't know the answer, and I don't think anybody does. This is one of the questions that's out there among researchers and drug companies and myself. The question you ask: What are the real long-term benefits? I mean, are people eventually going to end up with a shorter life, which is most important? Uh, more, more risk of cancer or heart disease? We don't know. It's been it's been too new to know what the long term I, effects. I'm are interested in what the long term side effects are that people aren't experiencing right now. I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. AJ, the side effects like chest pain or high blood pressure or uh, peripheral neuron. I don't know. No one knows. It, it hasn't been around long enough to to come to those solid conclusions as what happens when somebody's on these for twenty years, and they will be. I mean, if you're starting, you can start pre prescribing these drugs for children at the age of 12, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, age 12. You know, so we're, we're looking at the possibility of somebody being on these drugs for 
70, 80, maybe even 90 years. So a good question, but no answer. Are these drugs, are they allowed to give children these drugs? Yeah, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that at age 12, wow. age 12, you could start in children with morbid obesity, really they're gonna be seriously sick or seriously overweight, not necessarily sick at 12, you're not necessarily sick, you're just, well, you probably have a lot of sicknesses you don't talk about, like constipation, joint pains and headaches and fatigue and oily skin and acne. They have those things from the American diet. So uh, yeah, at age 12 and age 13, you can start doing bariatric surgery on children. And you know what they say, AJ, is they say that this is not, this has nothing to do with how we live or what we eat. Their, their representatives come out and tell you that. This is a biologic problem. This is your fault. This is your fault that you're that obese because you have no willpower. Your stomach is too big for your body. You got bad genes. You don't exercise enough. It's your fault. Which means that you have no control. If it was your fault, you might be able to correct it. And so they set you up to, to not even consider the possibility that with weight loss, in particular with the right diet, that you would solve your problem. They don't want to tell you that. They go they actively, I'm serious, they actively these days work at, at providing a story that'll make them the leading financial successful company in the world not just in your hometown, not just in the United States, but they plan on being the the number one Fortune 500, whatever they would call it, uh, profitable country in the world. And to get there, you've got to not only convince people to take your drugs, you've got to tell them, you have no choice. Just stop even thinking about it. This has nothing to do with your behavior, which is what they say. This has everything to do with your biology, which you can't change. You know, it's when you start reading about this stuff, and you will, you can in your local paper, New York Times, Washington, Washington, Washington Post, USA Today, every paper. Uh, you can you can hear this message about the things that we brought up in this discussion. What is the long-term effect? We don't know. Uh, what has this done to the restaurant industry? It's caused them to decrease their profits. What's this done to the food industry in general? They make less money. But, you know, the people who, who uh, control, who are Eli Lilly and Novadisc, who control the uh, production and study of these drugs, they don't care. They're in business. This is a, a fight for success. And they consider success not whether you help people or not. It's how much money you make how, how, how happy your stockholders are. That, that's all they care about. Well, yeah, they really care about other things, but they don't talk about it. Certainly wouldn't put it in their promotion material. Is that, hey, you can take our drugs, but you know what? You can cure the problem 100% of the time by following the McDougal diet or a starch-based diet or whatever you want to call it. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred percent of the time. You will, you will stop obesity you will stop being over fat, which occurs in 91% of people. If you follow a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables and no high-fat plant foods, nuts and seeds and avocados, no other concentrated source of calories, starch, 70 to 90% of your diet, and the rest being fruits and vegetables. The exception, the fruits of avocado, I guess nuts and seeds might be considered a fruit too. Nuts and seeds and avocados, no. 90% fat. Loaded with calories. So that's not part of the weight loss program. Why don't they put that in the ad? If they really cared about the 8 billion people in this world or the people in their community or even their families. See, the same story is bought up by their close friends and family. They believe this too. You would think they would come out and say, because they're only focused on profit. The, the goal has virtually nothing to do with how well people turn out short term or long term, that the message is one of discouraging you from thinking about an alternative and convincing you that this is the way to do things. This is the right way. We have Oprah 
and Elon following this. Uh, you know, these these intelligent giants, if they if they do this, why not me? Uh, what do you think about fat shaming? You know, I've, I've used the term obese on this show and I've had a couple of doctors say that I'm fat shaming, that that I you can't say that word anymore. So like, right. what what do you say? Well, that's excess? Okay, I started out with a, a, with a my presentation I gave to you about words. The words are really important. And I listed, I, I spent days trying to, uh, trying to find the different uh, synonyms to the word fat, because like you, you know, people object to me to say, and people are too fat. Well, uh, oh, fat really describes a condition of accumulating excess fat. Obesity describes a condition where the accumulation of excess fat has come to the point where people self suffer disease. Okay, so the difference, fat means you're just fat. Uh, obesity means you are so fat that you're sick and overweight which is another term used overweight indicates there's an ideal weight which you should try and attain so those are the correct ways to use the words that's but then i tried to figure out are there other names that we could use to be less offensive now, early in my career i used to go on uh, television shows where fat shaming was a topic uh, 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 you know several guests that were obviously large size you know condemned me for fat shaming and you know, I I I, I told him, fine. You know, that's your, that's your point of view. But hey, we all agree that being fat makes it harder to get around. You know, uh, increases your risk of disease. So if you want to call it desirable, okay, fine. You can maybe convince some people, but you're not going to convince me. So I tried to find other terms like roly poly, uh, generous, or uh, anyway, I got a whole list. I got about thirty different names. I couldn't find anything that was complimentary. Rotund. You know, I, I, I couldn't find any term that would make people feel good. So don't let them shame you for what they call fat shaming and using the wrong technology. You ask, you ask them next time, well, what is the right word to use that's politically correct to describe these people? You want to call them overweight? You know, what do you want to call it? Well, I, 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 I can't find I, any I, nice term. But again, again, the proper use of these words Fat describes an immediate condition. You're just too fat. Obesity describes you being so fat that it's associated with sickness. And overweight is a term that's used assuming that there is a standard which you should try and attain. And you're now overweight based on this standard. That's the proper use of these terms. Everything else I can't find. I can't you, you ask your audience to... I ask you to try and give me a term that feels good describing people who are overweight, fat. I can't, I can't find any word that you'd like, like me to describe you. Well, you got one. Go I don't know because they feel like when we use these words, we're shaming people and that if they're overweight, it's not their well, fault. Why, why is there no term out there that doesn't shame people? The conclusion I come to is that every term used to describe is associated with a shameful condition. Maybe I didn't say that right. If there were any nice words to describe somebody who was overweight, I would find them. I can't find them. Every term is offensive. Why? Because being in these conditions are not desirable. Nobody can find a word that makes it feel good to be overweight, obese, fat. Rotund, roly poly, generous in the buttocks. <laughs> I don't know. You know, you could go on and on. I, like I said, I've got about 30 terms in the beginning of that one lecture. Well, do you think it's people, people, is, I mean, it, it, this whole thing about personal responsibility, do you think if this is a genetic disease or, or it, it is people's fault when they have excess? Well, well, let's start with an observation we can all make. Before 1980, 90% of the food in Asia, 2 billion people in Asia now in 1980, before 1980, 2 billion people, virtually no type 2 diabetes, virtually no obesity, 
90% of the diet is white rice. 1980 was a date used to demark when people started watching cable news and had advantages of transportation and communication and refrigeration and all the things we need to deliver the food, the rich food to people. And of course, who bought the rich food? Well, the rich people did first. And so what you saw in Asia is the business people, the politicians, and I can name one from Korea right now that would bring that thought to your mind. Um, <clears throat> They, they were the ones that could afford it. And so they got the money and the accessibility. And that's where back, uh, you know, in the 90s, when I would fly on an airplane and I'd look at the first class section, I'd find a lot of people who looked Asian sitting up there in first class, filling the entire seat. And some of them asking for a seatbelt extender. They were speaking Chinese and Japanese and Korean. All right, and uh, now it's to the point where the recent data, and this is published in 2013, it's worse now, but in 2013, I can refer to an article in JAMA, which uh, has found that 12% of people from China are now type two diabetics or some kind of diabetes. Most of it's type two, 12% in the, in the you know, right now, and half are pre-diabetic. So what happened between 1980, when they're eating 90% white rice, to now? What happened? Did they change their genes? Did somehow uh, God get mad at them? You know, did they suffer from excess bad luck? You know, what happened? Did, did uh, aliens from outer space shoot laser rays, rays into people? I mean, what happened? They changed their diet to a diet which guarantees you're obese or on semi-glutides. You've got a choice. And you're still obese on the semi-glutides and you're sick and you're broke. Let's, let's go get them. Let, let's, let's use the semi-glutides as a stepping stone. I mean, they've worked really hard, spent billions and millions at least, hundreds of millions at least, dollars on making this a public awareness. Let's tap into all their efforts by, oh, I'd, I'd love to make uh, these old people, these people from Eli Lilly and Norva Disc, I'd love to have them discover my work and make me an enemy. Yeah. You got to be careful. I've learned as a speaker of who you get on a debate stage with because you automatically elevate your opponent to your status. So I'd have all these people who wanted to debate me who you know, hadn't written 13 national best-selling books and done all the work and research that I'd done, but you know, because they you know, went to a health food store and learned about uh, avocado, they decided they could debate McDougal on the stage and they'll just tell anything they want. Well, I won't allow them on stage. You know, until you've earned the right to, to be on stage, you don't, you don't get that kind of free elevation. Well, I'm asking for free elevation. I know I don't deserve to be on the stage, but I would like to be. Make me your enemy. Front page. Dr. McDougall, a, a nurse named Lynn is watching, and she says that they are not allowed to say either overweight or fat. They're only allowed to tell the patient that they're at the higher end of the BMI scale. Oh, that's a good one. Or how about if you said you're you're approaching the size of the fat lady in the circus? There, there, you didn't call them obese. You're approaching the size of the fat lady in the circus. Come on. Yeah. I want I want one word now. I don't want a whole paragraph to somehow minimize the impact of this condition. Give it to me, one word. The, the, the higher rate of the BMI. Nah, you're getting to be as Fat as the fat lady in the circus. That's about as offensive as I can imagine me being. But that's me. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> it's, it's a tough Again, one. find me a term, one word or two words that can describe this condition where people feel good about it. You know, I just... I. Anyway, which, uh, let, let's see if we can, uh, uh, maybe I can do this. Oh, 
Okay. Here is the uh, the chart I was telling you about since we got a little extra time. I'm going to share again. Uh, all right, there's the chart that I've been talking about. Okay, you all have a good look at it, right? You see it, AJ? Uh, yes. What? Yes. Okay, it starts with politically correct. Try these terms. Mm. Um, <laughs> yes. it, you know, I'm Jewish, and we used to say zaftig because it didn't. It took the sting out. It was okay. a well, artist. Yeah. I, I listed I listed terms for people that people use to describe a condition of being you know, accumulating too much body fat to be healthy, over fat. Here's a port. You want me to call you portly? How about tubby? Would you feel good about being called rotund or pudgy or fleshy? Too big for your britches. There's more than one word. Well padded, ample, beefy, really. Oh, come on, give me a term. If you can't, then maybe nobody has made this association between obesity and good condition or good health. Here down at the bottom of the of the uh, slide that you're looking at is fat is an adjective. Obesity equates fatness with a disease. Overweight suggests there's an ideal weight. Those are the proper terms. You don't want to be called obese or fat. What do you want to be called? Come on now, I've been on this. I've been asking you this for over half an hour. Give me a term that feels good for this condition of accumulating more body fat than you know I found is I find desirable. All right. Anyway, I'll get back to you. Lynn, the Thank nurse, you. Dr. McDougall, Lynn, the nurse is saying that there's more concern over the feelings than the health of the patient. Well, you know what? You know what? The medical business is supposed to be concerned first about the health. And of course, people say, oh, you know, uh, I don't want to go there. I, I really am getting myself in trouble if I go there. Look, hospitals, doctors, et cetera, their primary focus has been and should be on people's health. And the feelings people have have something to do with their health. And not much. Not much. I don't care if you feel good or bad about yourself. If you go on our program, you're going to lower your cholesterol, get rid of your diabetes, lose weight if you're type 2 diabetic, have better bowel movements. You're going to do it. I don't care if you have good thoughts or bad thoughts. I don't care if you're a nice person or bad person. I don't even care if you beat your husband. I don't care when it comes to, you get my point. Um. Anyway, there's there's a singular focus on healthcare, medical care that includes helping people feel better. I, I, I'm not gonna in any way not recognize that. That's absolutely true. But there's something else going on. Heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, obesity. You know, compare that to how people feel. You know, I'd rather cure your heart disease than make you a happy person. You got a choice. Okay, you can die of a heart attack, you can suffer angina all the time, or I can make you smile about the world. I can use good terms when you come to my hospital. I can give you compliments. I can cut down on your hospital bill, which is extraordinary and will probably make you bankrupt. I can do that to make you feel good. Or I could cure your heart disease. What would you like? Again, I think you're getting me a little carried away here, AJ. I get accused no, of being I, I just, because it's so it's such a difficult, uh, sensitive subject uh, for people, and you know we want to help them, but we can't even use words anymore. It seems like well, you no, know, I, I gave you a couple challenges today. I challenge you to take those terms and find me a, a one that people feel good about. You can't do it, I don't think. At least up to now, I haven't I heard it. The people that you know, I would like Billy, my dear Billy, who's been on the show, says you know he's he suffered so much trauma and abuse over his life from being fat, or whatever. I'm sorry, whatever the word you oh, want. Oh, you're in trouble again. You should have called him portly. Well, I know. I just it's so hard. Like you know, and the thing with the pronouns, it's like I'm you, afraid to even speak anymore you know, from fear of offending I, somebody. I what? showed you the correct terminology. 
Yeah. Fat is an adjective. You're too fat. Well, that would that be a noun? No, that's an adjective. Well, well you know, doc, the people have these cards now that um, when they go to the doctor and they, they actually say, do not weigh me because you're shaming me. And oh. um, so they don't want to be, people don't want to be weighed anymore. Well, but, you know so. what? I work in an entirely different world than that. Uh, if if telling people that they were overweight, I think that's a good term. Uh, if I had to leave that out of my discussion with a patient, I would be doing malpractice. If I told you, well, uh, if I was refused to tell you you had an elevated cholesterol, high cholesterolemia, I would be guilty of malpractice. If I wouldn't tell you you had high blood pressure, malpractice. If I fail to tell you you're overweight based on the standards for good health, that's malpractice. So if you want to start out the conversation, the doctor-patient conversation with a card that says, I don't care what it means to me. I don't want to hear about it. In fact, what you ought to do is maybe just, maybe what you should do is just have a, a telemedicine conference with your doctor and turn the audio and the video off if you don't want to hear it. You can just tell the doctor your problems and get no feedback. There you go. Ideal doctor visit. Now, again, you're getting me kind of silly, AJ. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I like, I like it. I, like, I don't mind. I like it. I just want people to realize that I'm extending my boundaries of being politically correct. And you're, you're asking me to do that. And I'm pretty good at it. Well, I think the people that like you, and you don't seem to care when people don't, unlike me, but I think the people that like you like you because you tell it like it is. And you're going to be an upcoming speaker actually twice, at one live and one pre-recorded in the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And I, I'm very curious about what you have to say on this subject, because I think you've helped probably more people lose weight than just about anybody, in at least in the plant-based space, and, and do it healthfully and deliciously without the use of drugs and surgeries. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I think the reason is, is that I designed the program uh, 50 years ago with the attitude. You see, 50 years ago, I was in a residency program. I was becoming an um, uh, internist, internal medicine specialist in, uh, at, the, at, the, at John Burns School of Medicine in Honolulu. And uh, I would be taking care of people with kidney disease. In fact, so, so serious that they were heading for dialysis and they'd lost 90% of their kidney function. I was taking care of uh, people with heart disease that had lost you know, 80% of their heart function. So what I wanted to do, because this is my population right now, they're the they're sickest of the sickest, they're in the hospital. I'm taking care of them. What I wanted to do, and that's the way I explored it, is what would be the nutritional approach that I could use, which would give these people the best chance of living longer and better. And what I came up with is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I relied on a lot of people, AJ. You know, I didn't really invent this whole thing except for my interpretation of it. I relied on Dennis Burkett, Nathan Pritikin, Roy Swank, and Walter Kempner, particularly Walter Kempner. Uh, he was the, 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 the doctor who taught me diet therapy. He was at Duke University for seven decades. He was the, uh, the most important financial support for Duke University for two decades. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kempner used a diet. He didn't, he didn't compromise. You know, you ate a diet of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. That's it. And the results were phenomenal. Uh, what I learned from that is, is that even simple, uh, basic diets provide adequate nutrition. What well, they did on rice, white rice. They took vitamin pills, but rice, fruits, fruit juice, and sugar. If that is, was all that was required, and you think about it, that doesn't sound so weird, does it? What, what if when populations of people that are starving, you know, 50,000 people in your village are about ready to die because they don't have food. And the food they have is very simple. And whatever they, 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 they lick, they lick oatmeal paste off the wall to get under calories. So, you know, we have designed as survivors. We're the ultimate in the creation, I think, in many ways. It's also the worst of the creation, too. But, uh, yeah, 
you know, it's just built to survive. And if it can survive on, uh, you know, on a simple, that simple diet, or worse yet, the wrong food, then I, I was pretty confident that what I was going to recommend was not in any way deficient in calcium protein or even vitamins, except there are a few exceptions. But Dr. McGee. Anyway, they, they, he also taught me the power of diet therapy and that you could cure so much of people's ailments by simplifying their diet, a starch-based diet. This is a starch-based diet, by the way. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, I have my little dog, Bailey, here, and you can't yeah. see the whole body, but when we went to the vet, the vet said she's fat. I mean, because she has, she's overweight. She just said it. She just said that, you know. But she was, it, well, you, you give them that list. Yeah, no, my vet just said your dog's too fat. No, you know? no, no, you give, you give him my list and tell him, tell him he can't call. Well, I, I suppose if he's using the ad, adjective properly, it'll be okay. But, but, it's but yeah, eight. there's no, there's no term. Make me feel good. Yeah. You know, it's Dr. McDougal, but we have a, I live in now in Northern California where there's a huge vegan and plant-based community, Linda Middlesworth, who's watching Esther Loveridge. And so we have these potlucks every month and we had ours yesterday and people, a lot of people brought Mary's recipes, confetti rice, for example. And like, we're sitting there eating this food and we're like, it's so good. Like, we just don't understand why people don't do it. Cause I mean, we, we gorge on this food. It's delicious. It's gourmet. It's, it, there's no deprivation. And we all, it's so funny. Like we're all thin, like, like every single person, not, we're not trying to be thin. It's just, we are like this yeah. whole huge group of vegans you have to be i mean if you're gonna eat a starch-based diet that's low fat you have to be trim you have to have your greatest endurance and function you're most likely to win a marathon on this kind of diet i mean we know that don't we don't we know that you the, the, the people eat starch-based diets they win the new york the chicago the honolulu marathons don't they you know who the winners are where are they from Africa, and you yeah. yeah. And what do they eat? 80% of their diet is corn. So, you know, you're talking about looking best, feeling best, functioning best on a starch-based diet. Now, let's take the opposite point of view, AJ. Let's take a look at what they're giving up. I can't get people to eat raw beef, even though I know there are some cultures that do. Now, I can't eat people to get eat raw chicken. Now, raw fish we used to eat in Hawaii. I, I realize that, but only after we covered it up with soy and hot mustard. Then we could eat it. But otherwise, you don't eat the raw fish with much enjoyment. Uh, so they're giving up the muscles, the animal parts, uh, which they don't like anyways. The only way they're able to eat these animal parts is they're, they cover them up with, with uh, you know, various kinds of ingredients. Wasabi, soy sauce, sweet and sour sauce, barbecue sauce. You know, anything to cover this stuff up because it's, it's bland or disgusting. You know, same thing with cheese. The only reason they can get you to eat cheese is they dump a load of salt in it. I had the experience when I was a resident taking care of kidney patients and I had to ask them to eat saltless cheese and saltless butter. The next day they all told me the same thing. Doc, I can't eat that, I'd rather die. That's just a glob of grease. Life would be intolerable. You dump enough salt in it and you consider it a delicacy, but that's why you can eat cheese. Oil. I can't get people to eat oil. I, I I asked people for 40 years to drink a glass of olive oil in front of me. It's so you'll throw up if you drink olive oil. Throw up, I would guess. So anyway, it, what are you giving up? You're getting up giving up bland and or disgusting and or sickening components of your meal. So why wouldn't just objectively be it right to eat the things that you enjoy? If you're going to sit down to a beef stew, it's not the beef you enjoy. It's, it's the sauce. It's the vegetables that are with it. It's the potatoes, the rice. It's not, not the muscle. I think Dr. McDougall, and I haven't, I haven't helped as many people as you know where near that, but I see where people struggle is is the, is going from giving up the high fat foods, even if they're plant foods. It's yeah. the Fat part seems to be the the sticking point for a lot of people. You're talking about fat vegans, right? Well, you know the nuts, the seeds, the avocado. You know, even yeah, even they're called like they're called fat vegans. I wrote a whole chapter in my book, The Starch Solution, about fat vegans. And by the way, nobody has found it offensive. They found it an article that was intended to further all of our causes. You might want to read that. Just go to my, our website, drmcdougall.com. 
put in the question bar, put in fat vegan, and you'll see the article I wrote, or, or look at the book, The Starch Solution, there's a whole chapter on the fat vegan. So that's what you're talking about. Let's just get it down to a couple, couple words, fat vegan. There are people who are concerned about animal rights, good. They're, they're concerned about the planet, good. But they're not concerned about themselves, their personal parents, or not, they're not concerned. They don't know the importance of looking good. You see, when you tell people about uh, the suffering that cattle and pigs and chickens go through and the little cages they're locked into, when you talk to, I talk to people about that, uh, that's, their, that's their goal. That's important. But if, if the person that's delivering this message about the cruelty of animals is 100 pounds overweight with acne and greasy skin and can hardly get around, what do you consider about the sincerity of their message? You think, oh, all right, okay, I get it, I get it. And I think it's important to, to end animal suffering and to save the planet. But at the cost of looking like you, you see, so if these fat vegans, and this is the way that I ended the article, but my whole message is if you could understand the importance of getting the cheesecake, the soy foods, the um, olive oil, et cetera, and nuts and seeds, if you, you know, if you can do that, then you can look the part where you can convey your messages of cruelty of animals and saving the planet more effectively. But if you look unhealthy, it's going to be a tough sell. You know, is that what the diet does? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything, but I can see what it does. Anyway, that's what the article, The Fat Vegan, is. Uh, it's just that they don't understand oil and cheesecake and vegan ice cream, and soy burgers and things like that. They don't understand the impact. We have a really active chat. This has been just quite the topic, and I'm I'm responding to people in the well, chat. That's okay. Well, you know, Mary, Mary's not throwing me off yet. Yeah. So, Doctor McDougall, can you give me another glass of water? Ma uh, Doctor McDougall, Matthew's saying, "Well, how long does it take to lose the desire for fat?" I know Doctor Esselstyn talks about the down regulation of the fat receptor, uh, but that that's where I've seen people struggle. Is that, is that even if they're eating enough calories, they seem to have a missing, and that missing, I think, is because they're talking about mouthfeel. You know, the dietitians, the nutritionists that I uh, meet that try and promote fat intake, they can't say it tastes good because it doesn't. They say it gives you a mouthfeel that's so enjoyable. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I've never really appreciated that mouthfeel, at least to the point of making myself overweight and sick. It ain't that desirable. They don't talk about it too much, but they do in that sense. How long does it take, AJ? I'd say two weeks. What does what does Essie say? Does he say two weeks too? No, I, I mean, I, I don't remember what he says, but I've seen people that I don't work with people individually or even in groups anymore that say it, it, sometimes people well, four months for, I mean, you really uh, stuck on cases, but you, you remember, remember Dr. Terry Shintani? Do I, I sold him my practice for a dollar. Right. That's, that's really, do you have anything else to sell for a dollar? That's a very, very <laughs> fair price. Yeah, it wasn't, like, it I, wasn't worth it. Much more I, I, I really like him. And of course he sings your praises and he teaches the yeah. same diet to you. And he gets people that are very, yeah. don't even know what to say, 400 pounds and more, you know, in, you know, in oh, yeah, the native Hawaiians. Wow. Yeah. And, but one of the things I remember when I yeah, interviewed that's... him from uh, one year in the truth about weight loss summit, as I know that you're familiar with the satiety index developed by Dr. Yeah. Susanna Holt, who says that uh, nothing is more satiating than yeah. a potato. And many people say, well, they don't like your diet or my diet, you know, low fat diet because they don't feel satiated. And what Dr. Shintani said is it's not the fat that's satiating, it's the caloric density that's satiating. And if fat yeah. is more than double the caloric density, that's what people are responding to. Well, it's more, more than caloric density. Uh, if caloric density was the answer, then fiber pills would have been the solution. There was a phase that we went through, and probably still people are doing it, where they take non-calorie or low-calorie fiber supplements. And these fiber supplements, they fill the stomach. So you get a temporary incomplete satisfaction just by mechanically filling the stomach. And then what happens is you the, the fiber passes out of the stomach in a few minutes, and you end up ravenously hungry. You got to go into the next stage of satisfaction. The next stage of fat satisfaction involves carbohydrate. Carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive, just like 
oxygen satisfies breath and water satisfies thirst. Okay, when I say what satisfies breath, you may say, you may say air. No, no, it's not air. It's, oxygen, right? Yeah. And if you say, well, food satisfies hunger, you only have it part, partially right. The real answer is, and there's one nutrient that is most powerful. And as you mentioned, the potato is most full of that nutrient is carbohydrate starch. That's the safe way to take in carbohydrate. The less safe, safe way or unhealthy way to take in carbohydrate is table sugar or agave or honey or molasses. That's simple sugars. Simple sugars rot teeth raise triglycerides and provide empty calories, which slow weight loss. Um, and you're, you become deficient in things because all it is is sugar. So uh, when I, I, as most of you know, who are uh, long-term followers of mine, you know that when I say sugar, I mean starch. But you know that. And I don't mean table sugar. Unless I say so. If I say so, then I mean it but it's carbohydrates satisfied. If you get up from a meal, and, and this happens to be a lot of people, AJ, is they'll get up for a meal and they'll think to themselves, whoa, whoa, did I just ate three places, three plates of food? You know, with the first plate, man, didn't notice much. Second plate, big plate, I noticed this mechanical filling on my stomach. And by the third plate of food, I finally got the message that it was time to stop eating. I was in pain. I was overstuffed, but I was still ravenously hungry. And so I, uh, people come to the conclusion, look, I ate and I'm still ravenously hungry. There must be something wrong with me. Okay. I am a uh, obsessive compulsive overeater or I got an eating disorder. I know so because I went to the psychiatrist and I was told I had an eating disorder. No, that's the, not the problem you have. I mean, you may have a lot of emotional problems. I don't doubt that. But your relationship with food is one of you're not eating. You're not eating what satisfies the hunger drive, which is carbohydrate. So you walk out of the dining room, still hungry, feeling mechanically full because you put something in your stomach and you walk by the candy machine. You go, oh, well, yeah, that's a drug. You know, this is highly concentrated. You can imagine how good it feels to have that dessert right after a meal that isn't concentrated in sugar. It's like a drug addict. Any of you who've been tobacco smokers or alcoholics or, you know, even more concerning addicts, uh, you know what the best cigarette of the day is, right? The one you just had? No, no. It's the morning, oh. the morning shot after you've been deprived all night. Mm. So if you deprive yourself all, all through the whole meal, you spend an hour or two eating and you're constantly deprived, you're looking for that satisfying ingredient, starch, and it's not there. Then what happens at the end of the meal is this drug, this concentrated stimulant. And it acts like people describe desserts as drugs. And so what happens is you have this inordinate interest in this first dose after a long period of deprivation. So yeah, I understand, you know, what happens to you. You're, you're, you're irresistibly attracted to carbohydrate. In this case, it's not the healthy kind. It's that candy bar, it's that sugar. But you could have easily, if you understood, you could have eaten potatoes and rice and corn all through the meal. And then what happens, you get to the end of the dinner time and somebody brings out a dessert and you go, man, I, you know, I don't really feel like I have to eat this. You know, it's, it's not something I really long for. I already got my carbohydrate in. I'm fully satisfied. And, you know, dessert doesn't control your life anymore. You, know, you do. Because, because something simple, you've satisfied your hunger drive. Well, what would happen if you, for example, what would happen if, uh, if uh, well, let's just say we take 18 breaths a minute in, in, on the West Coast. We do that. 18 breaths a minute, and somebody asks you to take in 16 breaths a minute instead of 18. How would you feel? Starved for a satisfaction of your breathing drive, wouldn't you? No. Well, you know, you'd do everything you could to compensate. You'd breathe more times a minute, but you're not allowed. 
Maybe you take and bring in an oxygen bottle that instead of 21% O2, it was 30% O2. Cheating, cheating. No, okay. Anyway, you, you get the point. Is that uh, that uh, deprivation, which is the typical American diet, results in uncontrolled behavior. You don't you don't hardly stand a chance, and and that's part of the reason uh, you asked me the question: Why do so people do people listen? It's because you know they're they're confused. They eat and they're not satisfied. They're still ravenously hungry. Well, they they're eating the wrong thing. What would happen if they, instead of instead of a uh, twenty one percent oxygen, you know, I, instead of eighteen percent, let's say I gave them eighteen percent oxygen instead of twenty one percent. Uh, what if they decided breathing more rapidly was not the way to handle the problem? The way to handle the problem is to increase from 18% O2 to 21% O2. So instead of eating 50% carbohydrate, you switch your diet to 90% carbohydrate. It's, you know, I think that's a fair analogy. Well, it's a, you, well, you'll, we'll always have customers, right, Dr. McDougall? Well, according to the semi-glutide people, we will. Their their destiny, their their goal. I'm sure they talk this way. This I know they talk this way. Their stockbrokers or their stockholders. They talk this about this in the newspaper, you know. So somebody has seen what I see. Their their goal is to take over the world to be the most profitable drug company companies in the world, and Eli Lilly and Novadisc, they've got full control, patents. They do all the research. What do you think they're going to do? Even at the mercy of the restaurants, even at the mercy of the grocery stores, even the fact that your doctor is probably going to see 20% fewer customers. Ooh, that'd be bad, wouldn't it? Even for the fact that your hospitals may end up uh, below capacity and have to close their doors. This, this could happen. This could re this, you should expect this. If they really are successful at reducing the food intake for 8 billion people, major things are going to change. So even though they realize that some of them aren't desirable, at least from your point of view and my point of view, things are going to change. This is a powerful drug. It's, it's got the ability to change history. But they also have an opponent. It's right here. Hey guys, you know, I'm waving my hand. Just notice me, please. No, they won't, or it's not likely. But if you guys go out and help me, you, you know, write letters and talk to friends and just imagine if we could only get 3% of the people on planet Earth to follow a starch-based diet, or, you know, any kind of vegan diet. Just what, I mean, think about it. That 3% would be out there telling the people who don't have the knowledge or the desire that there's a better way. That chart I gave you should be helpful. No. Print it out. Share it with. Send it to all your friends. Don't print it out. Put it in a, in a, a downloadable file, and attach it to every email you send out. And say, "Hey, would you like to talk about this chart, Doctor McDougall, uh, put together? And this is the kind of diet I've been following. And I want to go over with you the option of the most popular weight loss program in the world: semiglutides. You know, forget." Jenny Craig, or in fact, some of these standard weight loss programs are now using Ozempic and other drugs as part of their as part of their program. It's become a part, a regular accepted part of it. There's a there's a company out there. It's called I see it on on television. I think it's Joe Co. Is, is that right, Mary? J O C. What is it? Pardon? Oh, Roco. It's R O dash C O. I think that means it's from Colombia. Roco, you watch the TV ads, they tell you that they imply, or at least the message that I got, was that you know all you have to do is ask, and we'll take all of the semi-glutide needs that you want and get you on the, the program. So Zempic, Wigovi, Manjaro, Zepbound, Treforum. <laughs> but you know what happens when you call them up? They offer you a prescription. Then you have to go get the drug yourself and you have to pay for it. It's not in their subscription fee for their program. You have to go out and spend $800,000, $1,400 a month for the drug. 
all they give you is a prescription, maybe a little encouragement also. So, you know, uh, the, uh, the chances of, of these companies, two companies, Eli Lilly and Novadisc, of losing this effort is pretty small. But I see, uh, I don't see another more effective drug. I certainly don't see any form of bariatric, you know, that's weight loss surgery, uh, taking a big place. I don't see the low carbers, the keto, the Atkins people taking any type of, uh, of, of their market share, any significant amount of their market share, because we know these keto diets are dangerous. You know, they give you more heart disease, more chance of dying. <clears throat> you know, what a keto diet is so basically animal foods without starches. And anyway, they, they, they suffer, they have no competition, nothing that will offer them a challenge or nothing that will offer the patient population an alternative. Well, we have an alternative Print it out in the chart that I make available for you. It tells you all the things. We both lose 25 pounds in a year. We're pretty close. Okay. We cost nothing. We result in great health. They cost a lot. And bad health is what they desire. Yeah, that's... How long did it take for FenFen to be a popular drug before they discovered the heart lung defects? Because I'm curious. I, I'm just worried about the future side effects that we don't know about. You're right. You rightly show. So is, so is everybody else. So are the the scientists at Eli Lilly and Novadisc. You know. So are you know the doctors who are study this and and take care of patients and publish research paper. We're all we're all worried about things. You're worried about. It. AJ. It's just that we don't know. It hasn't been around long enough. And how long would it take? Well, you might see some long-term adverse effects at five years or 10 years. Or we don't have that kind of data yet. We've got one or two years, a few months of, of data. Well, probably, uh, we have, well, anyway, a couple of years at most of data. So we don't know. But you have your right to worry about this. FenFem, I don't know the history. I can't tell you when FenFen was invented and when it was the FDA took it off the market. I just remember they did because it caused heart valve problems. Wow. Well, Dr. McDougall, I mean, I'll, I, I mean, I'm never going to hang up on you. You got to tell me when to stop. But would you mind answering one question from someone? It's not on topic, but it, it, I feel bad because it's uh, it's important to them about uh, constipation because they're an ethical vegan and they said that you recommended lactulose for chronic constipation, oh, um, yeah. but it's not a vegan product. So uh, what oh. would an ethical vegan? Well, I didn't. I didn't know that. Okay. I, I didn't. I didn't know it was derived from animal foods. It's a sugar. You know, I'm. I have no doubt they could make lactulose from other things like plant foods, but the question has never come up. I've never researched it. And if it's true, then I would probably stop recommending. It's a pretty, pretty good drug. Is there a vegan? I would certainly recommend that they get lactulose from other, some other source besides milk or wherever they get it from, lactose, lactulose. I, I, I don't, they don't have to make it from any animal. They could do it otherwise. Mm. So, so that's, just a, that's just an error in my fund of knowledge, which I'll try and improve. Okay. Great. Well, boy, this is quite a, quite a discussion we had today. Well, I hope it gets some attention, AJ. I, I, I think I, I told you all along, you know, you're destined to become one of the most important podcasters in the world. It's just going to take some time. You know, you bring together people who have really, really positive messages for your viewers. Uh, we're going to win. We're going to win because we're on the right side. And uh, you know, I still believe that that the good guys win. There's lots of reason for me to doubt it, but I still believe it. That the, the truth holds out, and uh, the fight against good and evil weighs down on the side of good. I have to believe that. I'd go crazy if I didn't. Yeah. Well, like you say, the truth never changes. Never changes. So. <clears throat> Why do you keep saying the same old thing? <laughs> well, because the truth don't change. Now, you know, I came, I came to these conclusions, almost every one of them. I, you know, my, my approach really hasn't changed uh, in, say, 40 years. Uh, 
Why should it? The science hasn't changed in 40 years. The truth hasn't changed in 40 years. You know, the world is still round. It's not flat. Even though they discovered that, what, well, a long time ago. But wow. they used to believe it was flat. <laughs> but that's okay. You know, it really is round. And if you have any doubt, well, I know that some of you are flat earthers. Not this audience, but there are flat earthers out there. There are people who believe that evolution is 6,000 years old. Not scientists. Not even religious scientists believe that. So maybe there's one or two. Mm. And always find somebody to support your point of view. I think politics has shown that these days. Is you can always find somebody that will buy into your lie. <clears throat> Our friend Daryl Woodruff is watching. You're his favorite. Ah, good, Daryl. You and oh, Doug. I'm so glad. Go happy to hear from him. Yep, he's a star McDougaler, and so is his wife Norma, and they're going strong in their late 70s and 80s. Oh, uh, good. Well, that's great. Well, and, you know, the, the important thing for me to understand is, is it's Dr. Woodruff. He's yep. a medical doctor. So he, he has access to all the information I have access to. And the understanding, the basic understanding for how I understand things. And for him, for it's been over 30 years we've been associated. For him to come to the same conclusion and other doctors, there are, you know, as there's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there's the Plantrician Project, you know, thousands of doctors, medical doctors, who have looked at the science. You know, I, I have medical doctors, really respected medical doctors, who make this statement, which makes me feel really good. When a new idea comes out, I look at Dr. McDougall's newsletter. I see what he has to say first, and then I read on the rest of the subject, because his understanding is pretty basic. And I need that to interpret what's going on in the scientific world. So I think I think that's a fair thing to say. Is I put it's not that I discovered this because I've got a, this communication from the Almighty, and I'm fed any special knowledge. I just work hard. <laughs> yeah, you know I I spend look Mary reads novels. I read research articles. I probably read thirteen to twenty journals a month. I mean, I mean, I don't read all the articles, but I look at the titles, at least, or abstracts of a good share of the articles. That's my passion. That's what I love. You ask me why I can remember these things? Because that's what I love. I love the science. I love the research. But I'm going to have Mary find me a novel. I've kind of got yeah, kind well, of some well, downtime here. I'm, I'm going to read. I'd love to know what kind of novels Mary reads. And Daryl corrected me. Norma's actually 92. Had no idea. You know, I, I was wondering about what you had to say. I remember her as being a little older. Uh, what kind of novels does Mary read? Um, uh, like uh, well, romance most, novels? Most of, most of them are, are just uh, out of enjoyment. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't necessarily read things so that she can increase her fund of knowledge. She just wants to have fun. Mysteries, she says, mysteries and thrillers. Nice. I, I, if, if I'm going to read, it's a documentary or a biography. <laughs> you know, it's I know. Uh, a whole different subject. Matter. I'm the same way, but Charles is more like Mary. He he likes to actually read books like the, that are that are fiction. I'm like, man, eh, it's not nonfiction. Aren't, aren't we lucky, AJ? Yes. I mean, we could have gone through our entire lives without finding Mar Charles and Mary. Oh, uh, and God. we would have been so incomplete. It just would have been so unbalanced that neither one of us would have had an enjoyable life, much less a successful life. And I know other people don't understand this, but I certainly know you to understand yeah. how uh, integral Mary has been and Charles has been in our lives. You know, we're really lucky. I wouldn't want to live with a person who is like me. Good grief. We've been fighting all day long. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean, right, AJ? Yeah. People are saying we should put you and Dr. Rogers on at the same time. Are you familiar with him? He has a regular Very much slide. So. Very much He's, so. I've known him for 30 years. He He's really a radiologist, right? Yeah, interventional radiologist, and he he pretty much agrees with everything you say. So well, I think that uh 30 years ago because of our contact we had some influence on him and i hope he's doing a lot of good i really do you know he, it's not he doesn't have the same position i have because of his training as in radiology 
And of course, I'm a general doctor. I'm an internist. I, I just take care of the generally sick population, whereas learning how to read x-rays and CAT scans and so on is of value. But, you know, it's not the ideal professional background to come from to take care of people who in general have health problems that need a whole broad range of help. You know, lab tests, education, you know, and, and I'm, I'm real, real pleased and proud of the, of the, uh, the accomplishments that Dr. Rogers had made, considering the fact that, you know, there are some reasons why you wouldn't expect a radiologist to become a, a plant food advocate doctor, but he has, and he's helped a lot of people. Have you seen the Netflix documentary, um, You Are What You Eat? Yeah. What do you think of it, Dr. McDougall? It's a story. Uh, let me see. I got to think about it. Um, help me, Mary. What do we think of You Are What You Eat, the twin study? We thought uh, they were too heavy into uh, unhealthy vegan foods. I think we thought that. Fake foods? Yeah, yeah they're into really into a lot of fake foods. In fact, they advertise a lot of fake cheeses on this documentary, which makes me wonder where did they get the financial support from this? But it's really heavy into into recommending a vegan cheese company, company, not companies, but company. And uh, we don't believe in that. And uh, you know, they put an emphasis on vegan, which we don't believe in. I've told you why. Uh, we believe in a starch-based diet. And uh, I don't know. You know, they... they Let's see, it was four couples, you know, men, men, women, women, twin couples mm -hmm. that went through a change that lasted, I believe, two months. And uh, the compliance issues were terrible. That's, that's one of the reasons that I wasn't impressed by this particular documentary or study is that they couldn't get the people to follow the program. And why couldn't they get people to follow the program? Because they don't have the education right. But as you know, I had the same feeling I have about other research projects that are done. Is you should have put them on our diet. You know, it's uh, you know there are a lot of studies out there that compare, for example, the Atkins diet to the Ornish diet, which is of course close to ours, and show no difference. Well, that's because the compliance is horrible. They hand a book out, and they say follow this diet, and that's the education level that they have. This takes intense brainwashing to get people over their misunderstandings. And the kind of program that we run, the 12 day telemedicine program does it best. I can tell you after 47 years of trying to help people through various ways, 48 years, that we, you know, we've gotten better. Uh, that uh, our team, which is, consists of people that you know well, Doug Lyle, Jeff Novick, Jack Dixon. You ever had Jack on your show? I yeah, haven't. You know, I've written him. He never gets back to me. I've offered uh, him. Well, write to Heather. He'll, he'll get him on the show for you. Jack Dixon is our exercise person. And he has worked with Mary and I for seriously more than a half a century. That's right. More than 50 years. He's been our part of our exercise training program. Uh, early on, we didn't follow his advice too much or well enough, but but we do these days. Jack's great. And so we've got these experts here. Uh, Chef AJ comes in and gives us a cooking demo, at least. And we have other cooking specialists. Uh, Heather provides a tremendous amount of practical education, how to eat out, you know, how to prepare your kitchen, etc. In addition to running this program, which is good grief, extremely. I mean, we are taking care of more than 50 people. You can imagine the skill it takes to make this program run like it is effortless. The program runs like it's effortless. Well, you know what that means. Somebody put a lot of effort behind it. Anyway, we have Heather and then we have two support specialists. We have uh, Stacy and uh, uh, Trace, uh, uh, Tiffany. Okay. Tiffany's been with us for over 20 years. Stacy's an RN. So we have two these two support specialists. They start out every morning with you and they find out what your blood sugar is, your blood pressure, what your weight is a couple of times. We don't ask you to weigh every day. But what are you going to eat today? You know, they help you plan your meals, uh, you know, help you deal with other problems that come up with family and friends. 
but they're with you all day long, the support specialists. And it's not only for the 12 days, but this continues once a week and then once a month for a year. These support specialists are involved with you for a year. And when you start thinking about what we charge and what we offer, I don't think anybody, no one's ever complained. They, they always think they get uh, more than what they spent in money. And we like them to describe our 12-day program as the best vacation, the best experience they've ever had. We work hard to make that happen. Now, I give five or six lectures. Every morning, Mary and I start out with a fireside chat. Every morning we spend 45 minutes personally with these people to talk about anything they want. So we do that for the whole 12 days. And then, like I say, the follow-up is great. Oh, if I forgot to mention Dr. Anthony Lim. What a charm. I tell you, I used to think I, I was a pretty good, friendly, communicative doctor. Uh, not until I put myself up against Dr. Anthony Lim. This man is... Well, he, he just communicates so well with people. You know, they leave his visit, which may last a half an hour, could last two hours, thinking this is somebody I really like. This is somebody who really cares about me. I mean, he's a special guy to say the least. Anyway, he, he also gains a lot. He describes this as the most important thing that's happened in his, in his career. And he's been a lawyer, or at least had lawyer training. He's uh, tried some medicine and you know, until eight years ago when he started working with us, he was not a happy doctor. I don't think you'd mind me saying that. And the last eight years have been a dream. Why? Because he has seen happen right before his eyes and under his control. Things that we were taught were impossible. But he, but he sees it. The diabetics getting off all the drugs. Uh, the people with uh, heart disease having tremendous drops in cholesterol and relief of angina. You know, people's daily complaints, their indigestion, their headaches, you know, there's more severe complaints, their inflammatory arthritis. He sees that go away in right in front of him. I don't even talk to these people. Sometimes I talk to them sometimes. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's been a great job for, for Anthony Lim, and he does a phenomenal job. Where every day where Heather and I have just, thank goodness we came in contact with him. But you know, it was a matter of circumstance. It's just a good of good luck for both of us. And I'll share with you, I know I've never shared it before, but I hope I get the story right. Uh, we, uh, what happened? Oh, I decided I was gonna see fewer patients because of my age and you know, I, I figured I should be less responsible for your good and my good. <clears throat> so we were looking for another doctor to help out giving the medical care. And we went to True North and we put out general advertisements and so on. What happened was, I believe it was his grandmother, uh, got the email that says we're looking for a doctor and Anthony Lim never even heard about us before that. And he applied. And then the history happened. You know, he became an extremely important part of the McDougal program, as you will learn if you participate with him. Plus he sees people, he'll see you without even going to the program initially, one visit. Well, that's how we got my friend Kathy Hester in because she was on the fence and considering another program. And I really wanted her to do your program. And now she's one of your biggest fans. She actually does a live stream with Stacy the, the, all the time talking about the Start Solution. And I said, listen, just have the consultation with Dr. Lim. If you yeah. end up applying, if you wanting to be in the program, then it will be credited because your March program is almost full now. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to the day when we have to run, run more programs every month. I mean, there are only 230 million people in the United States that need us. Excuse me, 330 million people in the United States. There are 8 billion people on planet Earth who will soon need us. Only half of them need us now. Only 4 billion need us now. The other 4 billion need, still eat starch-based diets. You know, they're the rural, rural living uh people around the world in Africa and Asia and so on. They they still live on starch. They don't need us. But as I say, this is rapidly changing. You know, China since 1980 went up from a country country with no no type 2 diabetes, no obesity. You know, that's not entirely true, but pretty darn close. To a, a population where somewhere around 12 to 14% of the people are frankly diabetic. I mean there are 
diabetic, period. And half is half the population of China is now pre-diabetic, which means they got a good chance of becoming fully diabetic, which means they're overweight, too fat, obese. Hey, they, they throw those terms in. AJA will throw them in a whole bunch of times. I'm still waiting. I'm waiting for the complimentary term. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, are the other countries as in love with these weight loss drugs as the United States? Because you mentioned that so many diabetics in China, are they taking the drugs to the degree no. we are? Soon. I mean, the rich people are. The people who bought into the American diet, the politicians and the business people, uh, they need us really bad, just like Americans. They, they've become westernized in their eating. They've become westernized in their personal appearance and their disease problems. Look, this is, has nothing to do with your race except related to culture, but nothing to do with race in terms of genetics. You know, this, uh, this is, well, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care if you're a nice person or a bad person. I told you that. You're suffering from food poisoning. And the way to solve the problem is to fix the food. But yes, true. I mean, the rural population of Japan, China, Korea, Thailand, can, uh, you know, these countries, they, most people eat rice still. They can't afford to do otherwise. So no, they don't need us. And they don't need the semi-glutides either. Ozempic would go bust in their first year of trying to sell these products to people in rural China. Uh, they're not looking to them as a market. They know who their market is. It's it's fat, rich people. There we go, that term again. Boy, oh boy, I'm still waiting for a nice term. You know what? I would love Dr. McDougall to be able to do a documentary on your program for yeah. Netflix. It's just, it's so hard to get funding. I've, I've been in a course all year with a really well-known filmmaker on how to get documentary television produced. And it's we not- did. We did a documentary with John Robbins. I believe it was with John Robbins. Uh, uh, Michael Clapper was in it. And uh, we did it when I was at St. Lena Hospital. I was there for 16 years, the, the most respected hospital in terms of heart disease in California. And why was I there? Well, because they're Seventh-day Adventists. But we did a documentary which played, I don't remember what the market was for it, but I believe John Robbins was involved. And uh, it talked a lot about my program. It showed, uh, you probably can find it on the internet. You find everything on the internet. Um, it talked, it talked to people about uh, the facilities, which were a hotel stuck onto a hospital, which was a problem, AJ. People didn't want to come to St. Lena Hospital because it was associated with sick people. Hospitals. When I mentioned hospitals, they an even thought it was sick people. And so they didn't want to come to a hospital. They wanted to come to a resort where healthy people came. Well, our resort was attached physically to a hospital. Yeah, the rooms looked like hotel rooms, but you go out one door, you're in the hospital right next to the heart surgery part of the hospital. So that was a problem. And the other thing is that St. Alita made a reputation for drug rehab. And people were afraid to tell their friends they were going to St. Alita because their friends thought they were drug addicts. So anyway, we did a documentary on the St. Alita program, showed the swimming pool, the hot baths, the dining room. We did, well, we did one. It was a long time ago, probably, probably in the late eighties, early nineties. Is there any way to see it now? Well, I like I say, the YouTube may have it. I I don't. I couldn't lay my fingers on on a copy right now. I don't know where they're at. Like, I, you know, they're pretty much every place. There's a documentary that goes through my whole life right now, that was based on uh, on the shows I did for Lifestyle magazine. You know, for I for Oh, for 35 years, so I was a co-host of Lifestyle Magazine, played in 95% of the households. We used to do all of these uh, uh, away segments where we'd go to places like um, wineries and exercise facilities and spas in Calistoga and you know, all kinds of different things. And we'd show these three, oh, pizza, we went to Pizza Hut and and uh, you, you see the segment on Pizza Hut and me ordering in a fast food restaurant, and it'll leave you laughing. And anyway, we uh, did all these documents. Well, they're all put together in a reel, not all of them, selected ones that you can find easily on the internet. It's about my history, and uh, it'll be pretty easy to identify. 
And it shows a lot of these segments. And of course, shows me as a much younger man. So what do you expect? That was, was a long time ago. Let's see, that was 19... Probably in the, in the um, early uh, late 1970s, maybe early 80s. I think 80s, uh, earlier mid 80s was likely when they started. But, uh, 90. You think it was 90, Mary? No. Okay, Mary says it was the 90s we started. Nice. But you know, that's, I that's a monthly a monthly show. Well, anyway, there's lots of a lot of shows, but you'll find that that's that's on the internet. I, I've been googling and I couldn't find much. I'll show you what I found after the show. But you know, I live near Weimar now. Mary, Mary, Mary send her a copy of the uh, of the uh, video that shows. Um, I don't know whether you can find it. You probably have to go use your computer as opposed to your iPad. No, I'll send it to you. It's real it easy to find. Just enter McDougal channel. I, I did. I found a seven minute clip for you from you at St. Helena's Hospital so far. That's what oh, I've you been found, doing. Oh, we send that to me. I want to see that. Okay, I'll, I'll send it to you right after. But there's the also a clip that shows uh, the various segments. It shows me at a fish market in Honolulu. And my message about fish hasn't changed. And it shows you we, we have a winery where we're looking at alcohol free wines. Mm -hmm. You know, my message has only changed a little bit about that. It's changed. You know, we, uh, you know, I did a segment with my father-in-law at a spa where we both had mud baths. Ooh, it was a disgusting experience. I, I remember it, seeing that. Yeah, yeah, that was, you know, Dr. McDougall, I live near Weimar and my personal doctor is Dr. Nedley and they run a program there. I think it's a little bit similar to yours. There's no oh, oil. Very similar. Very similar. You start. I believe it's a livid program for 12 days. But what's interesting, and in, in this is, this is, I mean, not that I need the program, but they don't give you dinner. They only give you breakfast at, at like at six or seven and lunch at two and then no more food. Well, you know what that's based on. Yeah, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper, intermittent fasting, which Dr. Uh, John I, think, I, think, I, think I think it's mostly based upon Ellen White's work and the uh, Seventh-day uh, Adventist philosophy on proper eating. You know, in addition, if you go to Weimar, which is a great program, in addition to hearing about the diet from a point of view similar to ours, not the same, you'll get a dose of religion. Why not? True? True, Chef AJ? He I, I see him as a patient. He's never... But you it. haven't attended the program. No, no, I haven't. But uh, but I did. I did go to Weimar, and it's like we're actually going to have a conference there. It's oh, so, I so did I. If you want, if you want to correct me, any of you who've been to Weimar and said you didn't hear a little bit about the Seventh Day Adventist, I, I'm okay with that actually, because I love. I mean, I mean that 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 wouldn't bother me. Well, personally. There are some people who would rather keep. No, their, I get it. I get their it. medical health away from their religious beliefs, and but I'm just curious though. One because... distinction that we have, uh, but otherwise you're going to get a good program, a good diet, and very competent people. Yeah. Because, you know, Dr. John Scharfenberg, who I'm now friends with because he lives here, he attributes he's over 100 and he says it's because he doesn't eat dinner. Okay, well, it's a new one to me. He does. You know, eat, I, he my my like philosophy is it doesn't matter when you eat, mm -hmm. how many times you eat a day, it's it matters what you eat. What you eat, so, yeah. I, yeah. That's what I believe, and I think I'm pretty, pretty close to being right. The, the difference in, well, no, there is a difference, so... If you eat multiple times of the day, in other words, you're a grazer or a nibbler, say 14 times a day you eat, you will lose more weight more easily and you will lower your cholesterol further than if you're a uh, a gorger. I'm a gorger. In words, in, yeah, unless when you take in one meal, two meals, or maybe even three a day, you have less effective results than you would if you expanded your eating to 14 meals a day. That's what the study was done, 14 meals a day. I don't so know yeah, you'll do better eating, eating less often is a problem. And uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure that there are studies out there. What, what, Mary? There are studies out there that talk about sh night shift workers. Okay, we're, we're, we have company right now, so I probably should. Okay. Well, th thank you so much. This was great. Yeah. Talk about it next time. The, the studies. Yeah, if you have me, oh, we're at first Monday of every month, right? Right. And also remember the, the, the last Monday of February, you'll be here live for a, a talk about the truth about weight loss. And maybe you're going to give that. Oh rare boy. That's, that's going to be a good one. I'll be at my best.
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. McDougall and Mary. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you very much, AJ. Thank all you for right. listening. It was wonderful. Bye -bye. Thanks all of you. Goodbye, Dr. McDougall. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.